You know, I was not expecting us to get this much progress done in this short amount of time. It was certainly a little bit faster than we both were anticipating. No kidding, we actually overshot what we planned to do. Hello everyone, welcome to the Big Cat Aethercast. I am Ray. I am Leo. And today we are talking about a few things. We are talking about the Stormblood Hildebrand questline. We are talking about the Return to Ivalice Alliance Raid. And the uh, post-Stormblood patch quests from patch uh, 4.1 to 4.3. Uh, but first, before we get into that, uh, have you had any updates in terms of your grinding experience throughout this game? Uh, in, in, in a way, I've managed to, to get all my crafters and gatherers to level 100. I have gotten all of my job quests, all, the, all of my main job quests to level 100. And then I started working on Viper. Mm, how's that been? Viper is probably the easiest job I've ever fucking had in my life. Even easier than Brain Dead Warrior. Brain Dead Warrior and Brain Dead Summoner. Yes. Because mm. the thing about uh, Viper is that the rotation, the one two three rotation, is well, it basically has two one two three rotations, mm. and they kind of. Uh, switch off on one another, they light up, but they're only set to two buttons. Ah. One, two, three is just one, one, one. Ah, I see. Yeah. And doing each of those uh, things will either give you a haste buff or a damage buff. Gotcha. And then it is a very fast class. It is a very fast class. When you're at max level and you activate your burst mode, you are but bashing a whole lot of buttons all at once it is it is crazy how fast that class can be wow yeah apparently the thing is i actually got into viper well before well after the change that they had apparently made to it after it had come out so i am not sure what had changed but apparently a lot of people don't like the change to viper hmm well, at least like the hardcore people. Sure, but they're the they're always the most vocal when it comes to things like this. Yeah, uh, but it's been pretty good. The quest line is relatively simple. A guy from Taral is hunting down a Taral Vidral, basically something similar to Valley Garmanda, mm -hmm. and we basically find out that it's been hunted and captured by a female Rogadin that is uh, looking to add to her collection and cause problems all over. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the Tyrell Vidral is smarter than it looks and ends up uh, offing her. Big, big Game Hunter gets her comeuppance, that type of situation. Pretty much. And she basically had a lackey that was that was in the Twin Adders uh, okay. uh, doing reconnaissance for her. Gotcha. It's a very short and sweet kind of quest line, but uh, the final boss fight against the Tyrell Vidral is pretty good. Nice. Uh, I guess I can kind of say that I am, I am not keen on the fact that the uh new jobs are only t tied to the first to the 10 levels mm -hmm. you get when you first do the job i kind of wish uh there was at least another series of quests you could do afterwards you, you kind of want this you kind of want a little bit of the length of like what they did with astrologian machinist and dark knight yeah where they kept moving them on and stuff mm -hmm. like that because i well that was because they also sent the original starting was 30 third level 30 yeah. And so you actually had a lot more time to play yeah. with it and a little bit more room to grow on the story front. From s up to s up to Shadowbringers, every quest ends at a level 80 capstone. Mm -hmm. Every job has a, has a level 80 capstone for the most part. But uh, from then on, from Endwalker onwards, it's just uh, 10 quests end. Mm -hmm. Which I don't like, but I can understand why they don't want to keep writing stories for all the old job quests. And that's why the role quests became a thing mm -hmm. in Shadowbringers and onwards. I see. So, yeah, I, I can see that. But I just wish you could get more lore and details about your job. But that's my own complaint. Uh, other than that... Uh, the uh, Mog Tome event is going on at the moment, and I have basically every mount from it. Every mount from it, and more importantly, you joined the Black Parade finally. Oh yeah, there was the Halloween event that happened. I got the outfit, 
You know what bugs me? What? I don't like the tiny wings on the back. Yeah, the, the tiny wings are definitely something that people sort of just... We're gonna crop this out of the photo shoot, thanks. Yeah, so... And what pisses me off is that I was looking forward to using the horns, maybe? Yes. They don't look good with my hairstyle. Yeah. Which is weird because it's the same hairstyle as the guy in the event. It must be some kind of just clipping thing, I guess. It's a clipping thing because I'm a fucking Rothgar. Yes, and they still do not know how to properly um, to craft for, for the frost. So sadly, this outfit is just going to be gathering dust in my glamour dresser. Yeah. Um, anything else? Uh, that's pretty much it for me. I am planning on doing in the future for my for, for the channel... I am planning on recording all of the Hildebrand uh, quest lines. Mm. So I had gotten a new outfit for my VTuber model of just me in the Hildebrand outfit. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be wearing that in the game, but... I mean, I think after the first series of quests, you should. It would be thematically appropriate. I mean, after the first one, maybe, maybe. Regardless, uh, I'm planning on rec doing like a new game plus version. I kind of feel bad doing this because I already know all the jokes and stuff. I think it would still be good just because it's always nice to see it and to go back on it now knowing everything, how everything plays out. I think that would be a nice recap for the series as a whole because it really is, to me, um, one of the shining moments that I, I guess because I am not a MMO guy really threw me off how there was a contention to the fan base that just hated that quest line. Yeah, it's weird that there, there, a lot of people hate it because the relic weapon is tied to, the Endwalker relic weapon is yes. tied to Hildebrand. And and I, I get it because pe there are people who just cannot have fun. Yeah. But when you see just the stupid amounts of joy that entire quest line brings especially the first one because i think uh, as much as you can tell there's a lot of jank in the first quest lines yeah it very much a lot of the comedy is in the ar series yeah i will tell you it gets more ridiculous and hilarious in the end walker ones i mean i would imagine we've already discussed um how we already discussed things that happened here, but um, I definitely hope so. I definitely hope so because uh, well, we'll get to that when we talk, when we actually get into it. Yes. Um, but yeah, I think it's still something that is very unique to Final Fantasy fourteen, and I wish it. I I my wish would be that it's advertised a lot more. Yeah. There's uh, there's also not that many uh, uh things on YouTube many playlists on YouTube that actually cover the Hildebrand storyline. The only one that I found that was as, as comprehensive as possible was literally from a guy I, I followed called Devious. Mm -hmm. He was like the only person other than maybe Shenpai who did a Eclipse show version of uh, of the Hildebrand and, questline. And, and, and that even then, like, if you were to try and look up, like, the actual, like, funniest bits from that... Very few and far between, and maybe it covers three jokes, two of which are in ARR, and one that was in Stormblood. Stormblood. Yeah. Those are the only three that usually get shared around a lot, and there's a lot more, actually. Oh, there's a lot more comedy. Like, even though we're going to, this is going to be a bit of a spoiler, both of us agree that the Stormblood one is kind of the weakest one. It's the weakest only because of. And this is, I said this back when we covered the Heaven's Word storyline. ARR had way more time because of its nature that they got to give a much wider story. Yeah. And so they had a lot more time to do slapstick. They had a lot of... And, and, and that slapstick gets referenced later on. Yes. So they really had a lot of time to play out with the jokes and the physical humor. Yeah. And, and, I, al and also, I'm going to tell you right now... From Heaven's Ward onwards, they kind of streamlined it to be like two quests per patch. Right. And I think that was, I think that's how they realized, okay, we don't want to over, because that was the problem that I did have with ARR was that it kept going on and on and on. And unfortunately, this was one of the few places where that length actually worked because it was almost like watching 
like three or four episodes of like a daytime TV show. Mm -hmm. And by the time that you basically compile the entire uh, ARR questline, it was like a full season of a TV show. So it took long, but it was very compelling in the end. Yeah. I think what would have made it slightly more tolerable is if we were doing this the entire... Because basically ARR takes you through all the major regions of... Um, uh, of the ARR, you go through everywhere in ARR. Yeah, in Aorzia. In Aorzia. So, had we started from the start and then left the conclusion of the storyline for after the patch, I felt that that would have been you would have everyone would have been like, okay, I, I've had enough of this. I'm going to go do something else, and then I'll come back and see the funny guys when they need me. Yeah. And I think that would have helped break up the monotony a bit. Yeah. I understand why they didn't put that as a priority because it's distracting, and a lot of people do not like that. But I definitely feel like had they done some level balancing, like start off um, uh, Manderville at 30 and then save the conclusion for post-patch, I think that would have, pacing-wise, would have been better. Because then trying to finish this all before 2.0, are you mad? I know, and I'm sorry for forcing you to go through all of it. On top! Of patch on top of patch ARR, by the way, yeah. So like, and the and the mandatory crystal tower raids. Yeah, the crystal tower kind of is all right in the aftermath. It really was just more of patch ARR. Are you like patch on, pa- uh, patch ARR is a slog. Is worse than regular ARR. Yes, I I, I, w- I would be willing to say that. <laughs> However, the payout is very good. It is very good payout, and I think that that's one of the things that I think needs to be. If I see any more reworks on ARR, I would not be surprised. Yeah, because um, to be honest, they've already cut out, like, I think 15 to 20 quests from, yes. patch AR, from ARR patch quests. Yes, and I, I remember seeing not too long ago, I still saw someone complain about the fucking, um, why am I gathering a bunch of meals for this fucking adventure troop that's not going to do a goddamn thing? Yeah, uh, I, th- the, I think the, ARR in general needs to be reworked a little. Right, a little bit more, but I think... Um, for the most part, um, the main comp- the main complaint with Heaven's Word and um, Stormblood Stormblood is just the fact that by streamlining it to make it easy to produce, they also did not give themselves they, enough. They they did some good things, and we'll talk about them when we get into it. But they definitely could have done a little bit more. My biggest complaint is that because we got to spend time in ARR. We ended up having one of the best side characters who should have been returning. Yeah. In uh, Briardian. In Briardian, uh, even though he does make a cameo in a in a Heaven's Word side quest, um, I felt like um, what's his name, Seer. Yeah. Seer and our new our new companion in Sh- this quest line, Shigure. Shigure have the potential to be as good as Briardian if they had the chance to let him grow out. Yeah. I do think Seer is a little bit better than Shigure. Yeah, because Seer gets the Seer plays the straight man, is it, it, he and he gets the he gets to play you. Yeah, when you were the straight man in the original series. Yeah, and Shigure kind of sadly is the butt of the joke most of the time. Yes, and but I think that's also fair because again, part of the part uh, I will say this to the benefit of Stormblood. Part of the benefit is they're leaning more into the Japanese style of humor. Yes, this is very much like. If you have seen any joke anime or any uh, any am- anime where they have comedy skits throughout, some of these things will look very familiar to you. Right. And even then, like, AR also is very guilty of that. So this is, this is by all means, very tongue-in-cheek. So some of it may be a overplaying of the hand, as it were. Right. I, I feel like that would also be a part of it. But also, again, just the overall length. Also the ending. The ending I have issues with, but we'll address those once we get to it. Fair enough. For now, uh, let's talk about what you've done uh, in between all this other stuff. Like, yes. Like your side things. Okay, so I, I already mentioned I've cleared... Um, let me see. I, I'm trying to remember what I actually did. I think I did Red Mage throughout. You did Red, Ma- you did Red Mage throughout the main story. And Monk. <laughs> And Monk, and you were working on Dark Knight and Astrologia. Okay, so let's go through Dark Knight. So Dark yes, Knight. So this is one that we can both talk so about. So Dark Knight um, continues on with more. Uh, so 
Dark Knight, I did, me- we did, I did mention the start of it the last time. Yeah, where, this- where your soul crystal breaks and you encounter a strange kid who looks like a cross between Ysail and Horshafon. Horshafon, his name is Mist. And he says he's trying wants to help people deal with their grief. And so what you mostly are doing in uh, the Dark Knight quest line is you're going throughout areas in Heaven's Ward to go ahead and uh, help re- help war refugees deal with their grief. Right. By going ahead and conjuring up the illusions of their lo- loved ones to try and either say goodbye or deal with whatever is bothering them. Uh, and for a couple of times, it does work out. Sometimes it doesn't. And in the later part of the chapter, he summons back the mentor of Frey and Sidurgu to go ahead and have an impromptu battle with us, uh, resulting us in having to go ahead and take a few blows for Sidurgu and to make sure that he doesn't end up losing to the illusion. Right. Uh, in the end, Frey it gets really pissed off that we're not helping and that... Well, because, well not Frey. Uh, missed. 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 Um, either way, um, Mist is upset because not only... Do they? Because they are only here because they are basically drawing off the ether of others. Yeah. But also because of the fact that we basically they want to go ahead and create a world without pain. Yes. And see that us by by not allowing them to indulge in that desire ends up it goes against what they feel and goes they go on a rampage instead. Yes. Which cause which. Uh... Sidurgu and uh, Riel try to stop and get get squashed, to which we had to confront Miss. And it's at this point we know who Mist is. Mm-hmm. Mist is our is is another part of ourselves. Yes, it is our idealistic self. It is our it is the part of ourselves it, that wants to do good, it, it, wants to be the hero, wants to do the right thing, it, wants to. Not cause any pain. If Frey was supposed to represent our id, Mist is representing our superego. Yes. So, uh, which all consequently does resolve to bring Frey out. Yes. In, or, in order to go ahead and give us the support we need to go ahead and end a Mist existence and return him back to the Soul Crystal. Right. Which we do so and have some final words with um, Count Edmond before we go ahead and get some closure in regards to the entire thing which brought about this transgression, which is thinking about how we failed Horshafont. Bingo. How we failed Horshafont, how we let Isail die, pretty much. How we let so many countless others die at our hands. The war, beware the warrior of light. Beware the weapon of light. For he who stands against it is doomed to fail. Be, uh, beware those who stand with him, for they are doomed to die. Yeah. So that was fun. Yeah, and then of course it ends with uh, Frey saying to Miss that I forgive you, I forgive you, I forgive you, mm-hmm. and that just hurts. Mm-hmm. That hurts. Well, no, not just that he forgives him; he forgives him because we would. Yes. Mm-hmm. And so he forgives me. So of course I got to forgive you. So because in the end, this is all. This is all still your warrior of light dealing with themselves and they do have to accept that yeah in order to move on which i gotta admit the dark knight quest line is probably the best quest line in this fucking game you know you there, there are a few good replacements for therapy i would say playing dark knight is one of them pretty much and of course it does have a capstone uh, quest at level 80 mm-hmm. so once you beat Shadowbringers, you can go and do go back uh, and talk to sit Sidurgu and do the capstone quest, which will completely capstone the Dark Knight quest line and gives you a, I think, a really good solid ending to, to the whole thing. Okay. Um, I did Paladin uh, since the last time we were here. Paladin, I had mentioned that um, that was the... I wanted to get a reference in there because if you do Blacksmith, uh, it does come up again in uh, this quest line. And so I got to see the fruits of that. So the big thing is that um, the Sultana wants to go ahead and part of the uh, band making, merry making between alliances, she's throwing the full, the first old cup in years. Yes. Uh, which is just basically a massive tournament 
um, to go ahead uh, and have the winner go ahead to have a, a champion declared. Strongest of Eorzeans, knights, heroes, and do gooder and uh, fighters are brought together for purposes of the fight. Marcella actually makes a reappearance. Marcella being the gladiatorial guild leader, hmm. um, guild mom who, um, in the very start of the gladiator quest line, uh, basically was trying to keep the guild together after Aldous, the former guild master and uh, braveheart of the or golden boy of the guild, was basically thrown out uh, for accusations of cheating. This was resolved because we knew, because there was a rival who basically slandered his good name. But he went ahead and exi- uh, kept on with his exile because, in part, because he's a free spirit, and in part, because he wants to grow stronger. Anyway, all this does come back. He comes back in the guise of the Black Lotus uh, f- fighter, and he goes ahead and you see him because he uses his trademark shield parry uh, in one of the earlier fights, mm-hmm. and so we know that he's back. However, uh, some monitor has decided that they want to. Rig the bets, rig the fight so that they can gain illegal betting money, which Aldous cannot stand. He purposely drops out of the finals, um, so that way you wouldn't have to, he wouldn't have to throw the match, even though he was probably certain that he couldn't beat you anyway. But wasn't gonna wasn't going to let that be an issue. Uh, Aldous does go ahead and meet you later, explaining that he wanted to go ahead and see Marcella again, but couldn't because of the situation with the monitorists. He also reveals that he had picked up a orphan who he's basically treating as his child um, for purposes of raising him, uh, who gets kidnapped by the monitorist that you have to go save. And there's a lot of there's a little slapstick joke because Marcella still denying her feelings for all this does get a little bit miffed when he mentions that he has a kid now and she takes it completely the wrong way because of, of course she does. Of course. Uh, that does get cleared up later when you do rescue the kid and she realizes, oh, the, the dates don't line up. And he's like, what, you really thought I was gonna, I was going to knock someone up? And then she get, and then she gives the Sundari response. Of course she does. Um, if but, I recall right, the gladi- the uh, capstone quest for the paladins does kind of do the gladiator stuff again. Hmm. So it's more of a capstone to that than it is to the paladins. Yes, although I do appreciate, at least for some of the Stormblood quests, they do incorporate your original guild a bit more um monk you get to go back and bring the bra- uh is an in- exchange between the brawlers guild as a setup for um not only ex- having them as a callback for the monk quest line but also ends up being the solution as the the bad guy who shows up uh not only is calling himself the true inheritor to the mad king's throne but also apparently found secret techniques to deal with monks which they make actually a very interesting distinction that your initial brawler style is completely separate from your monk teachings later on. Right. Those are actually considered two separate fighting styles. And uh, I didn't mention this earlier, but that actually gets factored into the... Re- that is at least, I think, part of the reason why the rework is being characterized the way that it did. So I'll explain what changed with monk uh, in Dawn Trail. The biggest thing that they changed change with Dawn Trail is they changed how the the um, the style system works. Right. So it, everyone's used to there being a chain loop. You basically had uh, three styles: Opo, Opo, um, Bird, Cur- Cat, and Monkey. Yeah, Opo, Opo, uh, Curl, and I forgot the um, third one, but the Bird style. Yeah. So you had those three styles, um, and you basically, uh, as you chain them from one another, they gain buffs. Once you when you go from uh, pugilist to monk, you learn a you learn a second trio of one two threes um, that basically if you cross them over at certain points, um, it would yield a different set of buffs for the attacks. Now what it's done is that your monk one two three buffs your pugilist one two three. Right. And so specifically, there is an optimal way of chaining. Uh, Pugilist one two three to Monk one two three, and then intermingling that, you thread in your unbound forms uh, styles or un- unbound chain combos for the Nadus, and then you get your uh, hyper moves from there. Right. Also threading uh, Steel Back uh, Forbidden Chakra um, at the end at uh, seventy, which hasn't changed much. You get Brotherhood, 
which not only goes ahead and lets you stack 10 chakras, but also amps up your... Uh, also gives, I believe, it's a party-wide damage buff. It, it, I believe it's a party-wide damage buff. I forget if, if it's a party-wide or if it's tied to a single DPS. No, it's because the, the, the benefit... The interesting thing about Brotherhood is if you have multiple monks in the party, it double buffs them. Ah. So, so that's actually one of the interesting jokes there is that... Uh, if you are in a party with... It, it acts as your party-wide buff uh, because you get a regular one in Mantra of Fire, which uh, monks desperately needed that compared to some of the other classes. Mm-hmm. But uh, Mantra of Fire is your personal buff, and then Brotherhood is your party-wide. And the, and the interesting thing is that it also gives you the chakra buff as well. I see. I know that Monk is actually considered one of the fastest, if not the fastest, DPS class. It is. The trade-off is you have no ranged. And yeah. I can tell you, having done Alexander as a monk, or not Alexander, Omega, having done Omega as a monk, there are a few handful of times where it's like, I can't punch because the opponent's AoE is right is between us, and if you were closer, I would be fisting you right now. Yeah, pretty much. Monk still does not have a range. I Actually, I think it does get a range later on. You, you do get... Okay, it's not entirely true that you do have one ranged attack. The problem is, is that it's the... Um, it's the level 5 chakra AoE. Which you don't have at the moment. Well, you have it, but it, you only get it if you have all stacks of 5 chakra. And you basically do a power wave that goes a distance. Ah. But it's not available all the time. I see. So so that's the problem, is that you're... And you do have some AoE options, but those AoEs are circles, so... Mm-hmm. <coughs> Centered on you, you're not going to have it available all the time, and you're not guaranteed to be able to proc it all the time. Right, right. Uh, okay, and other than that, you also said you were starting to work on Astrologian. I was starting to work on Astrologian. It's not there yet. Um, they do do a funny thing where basically um, the quest line involves you meeting a, um, a Hingashi Geomancer. Ah. And basically you find out that astro- Astrologians and Geomancers are basically part of the same school. It's just that one direction looked up, the other direction looked down. That's kind of funny. It, it's sort of like the it's sort of like the 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 pearl and diamond clan splits in which one of them says, "No, our god is this," and they're the god of time, and the other clans, "No, their our god is named your god, the god is named this," and they're the god of space. And then it turns out they were both right. Pretty much. It, it seems like we're going for that flavor here because the geomancer we're introduced to is basically the exact opposite of your of the astro mentor. And they, she cannot stand him because he is a total, he's a total louse of a man. Oh, <laughs> and, and and to the to the extent that she basically calls him out, like oh, when he has to run back because his clan called him back, he's like, and so he decided not to leave all the women that he was flirting with the entire time that he was here. Uh, to which I feel like the only reason she uh, was insulted was because she wasn't on the list. And to be fair, the only reason she wasn't on the list is because per the last quest line, she had to fake her own death and disguise herself as a boy. Oh boy. And she still has her 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 boyish haircut or her pixie haircut while you're doing this quest line. So it's probably one of the more drastic changes to where a character has changed themselves um, and has continued to remain through. They are still recognized by their old name. But characters in cutscenes will will refer to them by the cover name at times. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Uh, I haven't. No, wait, been... no, why don't I remember that? Uh, what? My brain derped. I don't know how you remembered something that you've never done, but My... it's been a long week. Apparently, it has been a long week. Uh, but I still haven't cleared it yet, so I'm still working through it. Haven't touched machinist yet. Where I have made a lot of progress is on my crafter and my gatherer. Right, so you're working on minor, right? Yeah, minor. So I will say this because I didn't really acknowledge it as much in the prior patch. Boy, howdy, can you uh, do they make grinding up crafters and gatherers way easier after having worked? Oh yeah, they basically say here's the items you need, craft it in the right way, and then deliver it. Yes, you, it's always going to have to be high quality every time. But by this point, if you actually understand how the system works. Very easy to do. Oh yeah, it's a it's a simple rotation. Yes, and then uh, and then you only you're only adjusting for basically the quality of the item. That's really the only uh the only difficult part at high stages. Yeah. 
What's more interesting is the fact that as far as experience goes, one, they give you quite a bit of experience just off of the regular quest lines alone. Even even though I was um, uh, food stacking and I was wearing the uh, EXP boosting earrings the entire time. Yeah. But even on top of that, um, expert deliveries basically are your grind quests now. Yeah. You get 12 of them a week and mm -hmm. you basically just fill them out as much as possible. Yeah. And they get, and I think because I didn't do this until the end of the patch quest, you get four, I think, because you get um, you got you got Zoe Aliapo, you've got uh, you've got uh, Monago, Monago, Kuranai, Kuranai, and, and then you have Adarak. Adarak. Yeah, I don't know how to pronounce okay. his name. So now you have four. Technically, Zoe doesn't count because she's not sixty. But the other ones go from sixty to sixty above. Yes. So and you get and you get three more with each expansion, which make which basically means that as long as you pay attention, and you do what you're supposed to, probably can grind up uh, your classes very quickly. Yep. I will say, however, I think this may come to bite me in the butt later when I get my retainers to that level, mm -hmm. because at least for minor, as far as I'm concerned, my problem with that is that. Uh, in order to mine certain equipments or certain materials, if you're going off of a gatherer, yeah, you have to gather them yourself. Pretty much. And if you don't put out the legwork to go gather them at least once, uh, where does that leave you? Pretty much, yeah. So basically what you got to do is with each expansion, just go around each map and mine and get one of every item. I will say, though, that is also one of the things that does mildly grind my gears is that you still have to, when you switch, and correct me if I'm wrong, because it might be just I didn't, I'm not engaging the right uh, ability, but you still have to go ahead and use um, Lay of the Land in order to find your your mining points, correct? You need to have, you need to have Lay of the, An Lay of the Land, Prospect. Prospect and Lay of the Land and Sneak pretty much active at all times. Right, Prospect and, La and Lay of the Land I do have active, but the fact that you, or, or Prospect and Sneak I have active at all times, but the fact that you have to proc lay of the land every goddamn time. That's that's not... I mean, you have free things. It's always active for me. No. Uh, prospect in, lets, uh, engages you to actually mine. Yes. Sneak makes sure that you don't get proc by enemies so long as that you're over their level. Right. Lay of the land, you have to proc every time because it will only point you to the closest node to you. Oh, that one, that one. Yes. That skill, that skill. I was thinking of something else. Yes. So that's that's the only nitpick because it means that you have... The, and it will always redirect you to the closest, not necessarily the same one that you were initially targeting. Right. I'm going to tell you right now, uh, past uh, ARR, there's going to be uh, six nodes in basically a triangle formation. Mm -hmm. There's going to be two, two, and two. Yes. And those are basically going to have the same items within those. Yes. And so you just cycle you just cycle through them. Yes. I do, don't do mind that. What I do mind is that, okay, where the fuck do I start? That's usually where I have the initial gripes. Because when you... I when, mean, yeah, I, I had that problem. I was currently looking for a bunch of corn. Because when I was doing Heaven's Ward, and uh, there's a late game, there's a late stage quest mission where basically it's like, all right, all right, we need to gather a bunch of stone for this next thing. Eh, 60 samples should do it. And so it's they make you trudge out there and you do see the triangle of of where the quests, of the where the markers are. And I literally just stayed there for like 20 minutes gathering up so I could then sell the excess off on the market board. Yeah. And I, if I recall right, for the minor quest in Stormblood, you had to go to Azizla? Or... Um, no, not Azizla, Idleshire. Idleshire. That, so we were helping out the Gobsmith Works in terms of... They wanted to build a sort of like a wrecking dozer. Oh, yeah, for their I operations. That. And so basically every member of the crew had their own ideas about, no, we need to go in this direction. No, we need to go in this direction. And they had their own ideological stances. And you basically went out there. Uh, you basically talked with the head foreman. Um, he said, well, can't you just do both and find something that bridges the gap between them? And basically you would have to go out and, and mine whatever material you needed yeah. in order to make that come true. If I recall right, it's always a specific material at a specific location. Yes. And so here's the changes that I didn't like for uh, what I learned now for minor 
So whereas smithing, you basically, they gave you the materials and you just said, and they basically said, build it. Yeah. Um, Miner says, okay, don't start until we tell you to. Pretty much. And then don't gather anything more than what we tell you because it only shows up for this quest and it is basically junk afterwards. Pretty much. Which is probably the one thing I hate it because I can always basically rely on Okay, well, if I'm this level and I go ahead and grind enough sock, then I can keep some of it for myself and then and then just turn in the minimum for whatever the quest is. Yeah, and then sell whatever's left on the market for So I guess apparently they didn't like that uh, that, that trivializing of the storyline and said, no, 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 you have to go mine the thing out when we tell you to. I'm going to tell you this right now. Uh, for uh, Sh- Shadowbringers has their own thing of role quests. Mm-hmm. And so does Endwalker and Dawn Trail. For crafters and gatherers. Okay. What you have to do then is you have to co- make gather collectibles. You have to activate the collect button on on your uh, bar, mm-hmm. and then you have to collect the highest quality of a certain item. So so it becomes so they basically also changed it to where not only is it they basically storyline uh, cr- collectibles into your storyline. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And. Uh, I'm going to tell you right now, I don't think that there's a, a major reward for Storm, for uh, Shadowbringers uh, collectibles, other than, I think, some fireworks. Mm-hmm. But uh, when you do the Endwalker ones, you actually get a nice little minion. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. And they haven't uh, released yet the uh, combined patch for uh, the Cat Crafters and Gatherers in mm-hmm. Dontrail, but I have done that all. I'm willing to bet there's going to be something you get for that as well. Okay. Um, one minor note, just because it did come up, um, oh, let me just finish the miner's quest line first. So, basically, the foreman realizes that he's not really good at getting his team to get down and do what they do, and he sneaks out of Idleshire to go talk to a friend about his troubles, neglecting to tell the team that, hey, I need to go take some time off, don't burn the house down while I'm gone, and so everyone on the team thinks they were responsible because they basically caused too much stress on their chief. And so this causes a rousing uh, reunite the team together moment. And they basically finish the project on their own by the time that the chief comes back and realizes, oh, I guess I did do a good job leading after all. And, and so it, it sort of resolves itself. It's just kind of funny. And they come in with a big gobby machine tank. Yes. Um, which is really cool. Yes, it is. It's, it's all to defend Idleshire. Yes. Yes, it, it is part of it, Ilshire Construction and Defense. Um, so before I go ahead and go into the uh, Crafter's Quest lines, have you done any uh, Wolf's Den since we last spoke? I have done very little. Uh, actually, what I did recently was I tried a different one of the PvP uh, 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 modes. Modes, which, which was, was I tried Rival Wings. Okay, this is the... This is the uh, so this is the team PvP or is the what, what mode is it? It's it's team PvP, but basically, there you're defending a base, and okay. on either side there are towers which are protecting the the base. Okay. And basically, as you're going through, it's basically a big diamond shape. Mm-hmm. And as you're going through your base, you can sometimes have your base. Uh, craft machines like mammoths and war mechs and stuff like that they're basically alexander stuff oh, okay and you can ride those mechs and do stuff in them okay so it's kind of so it is it is straight up uh, like, kind of like a tower defense type situation. it is kind of tower defense i sucked at it well, i suck at pvp yeah no i don't like it either i'm only glad i melt i melt every time i'm in pvp no i'm the same way i i the only one that i ever had i i did um Crystalline Conflict. Oh, you did Crystalline Conflict. I did Crystalline Conflict. I found that one was a little bit easier because that one is Capture the Flag. And as someone who is not good at Capture the Flag, the answer is play the objective. Yep. Just play the objective and somehow it'll work out. Yeah. If you can't be the one in the in the crystal base helping it move along, moving along the path, just find someone and smack their ass. Yes. Um, and then the other one is the basically the... Splatoon 2, the, the the Splatoon triple battle of Final Fantasy XIV, hmm. which um, I'm trying to remember what that one's called, but basically it's the one where uh, you're all in bases and you have to activate Allegan uh, nodes, like capture the flag. Oh yeah, those that one. Th- that's that's just frontline. Frontline. So front, I've done frontline and crystalline conflict. Okay. And so 
Yeah, Crystalline Conflict was asked, but Frontline I was at least a little bit better at because I played the objective. Yeah. So that one wasn't too bad. Um, still, dog shit at it. I only did it just so I can grind up uh, the occasional equipment for materials that would look good for my glamours. Yeah. I was really... There are a couple of, like, uh, uh, summoner glands that I really want to get. Like, there's this nice fox mask that you can have on the side of your head. Mm-hmm. It looks really nice. So I I did grind for that a while back ago. I'm I'm somewhat okay at front line. I'm not the best, but usually I'm just the one standing in the thing while everyone else is kind of Yeah, like I said, if you play the objective on that one, it, you can kind of get by. Yeah. Um So going from that into the crafter quests, um so Blacksmith, um he, he, we have um uh, I forget what her name is, and I wrote it down just so I wouldn't forget. But you have a Kug- uh, Kugane swordsmith lady who is was refused to be mentored by her father, and so she basically uh, come- Seka Seka refused to get uh, taught sword uh, sword crafting by her father, um, who basically said was going about it the wrong way of saying, "Look, it's not that I don't want to teach you. It's just that you tend to be a little over pretentious." in what you make, and you don't actually make anything good. No, from yourself. Yeah. The, it's it's good in the sense that it visually looks appearing, but it lacks the soul of steel. Pretty which, much. Which is, which is a pretentious way of saying you don't actually make an original. And so she finally... Du- so she learns a lot from you initially, and then eventually she resolves to get her dad to do this, to get her to learn from her dad... And so the dad's like, fine, but only if you actually beat him in a swordsmithing contest. Which and, which is, y- you're, you're beating me. Right. You're being the warrior of life. Right. And I, if I recall right, our, our ever-capable drunkard of a sorts, uh, of a uh, of a guild master is along for the ride. Yeah, he's, he's basically there as the moral support. And I think the, the, the turning point is midway through the quest line where dad comes in and gives her the, you will never amount to anything speech. And he basically lays into her dad for for a good couple of lines, and then she falls for the himbo. Yes, she, she falls. She falls for the drunkard, the the drunkard himbo, and she even goes as far as to at the final quest line basically uh, confess to him, which makes the dad so bloodthirsty he goes for her katana and intends to test it out on his backside. To which he immediately flees on the first ship out of Kugane. Yes. And while he's happy that she was able to help out a uh, fledgling swordsmith, he laments in the fact that she made things incredibly complicated for him. I just want to drink and hammer out weapons all day. Why do I have to get involved in drama? (laughs) Yeah, that's actually one of the funnier quest quest lines uh, uh, for the crafters. Again, it is the second crafter quest line in which they bring out the... uh, the uh, Hildebrand music. So, uh, yes, I approve. Yes. Um, the uh, next, the the, ar- the, o- the only thing I'm sad about is that the Goldsmith quest line never involved Godbert. Yes, yeah, that that is a massive disappointment as I've seen in the Goldsmith quest line. So, uh, this one's actually this one's actually very on theme because this one, uh, the Sultana, ca- kind of happens in reverse order because the Sultana should have had this. It, it makes sense because I did it after uh, Stormblood, but it sh- this should have taken place after Stormblood, period. Because basically the Sultana decides she wants to go ahead and help the refugees out. Yeah. And she has a lot of the conversation that we're about to talk about here, but basically resolves to sell the crown of Ulda to go ahead and finance a goldsmithing school in Alamigo. Right. So she basically hires you, being the skilled uh, craftsman that you are, to go ahead and be the teacher of a fledging of a rag uh, rag type rag- group of uh, would be uh, goldsmiths. Of would be goldsmiths. Um, there's a pair of of brothers who basically one is good with gems, one is good with with stone, but neither have the strength of the other. And then there's also um, another student who's really good at planning out, but. Uh, Who's really good at working metal, but has some issues uh, with the other with the with the stone and the gems. And then there's the one who almost who basically had her own uh, crafting business at one point, but basically 
went out of business, and it's later found out that she basically has defective glasses and has not had them refitted. And so you make she she can see, and now she can craft. Yes. And so the that craft that quest line actually ends real sweet because the students uh, as their progress speeds up, they're like, you know, we want to thank the Sultana for everything that we did, so we want to craft something for her. And so they sneak into Ulda and find that the Sultana really wants an orchestrion, but she doesn't have any room in her in her chambers for it. They would need to make a super compact orchestrion in order for it to fit in her uh, room. And so they basically, because the orchestrions are all the sizes of, of jukeboxes. Jukeboxes. And so they basically resolve to make the first portable model, which is about the size of a... Uh, of, a, of a modern alarm clock. Modern alarm clock or radio. Yes. So uh, all the students go ahead and work on this and they also craft it. Uh, they craft all the components to hand to you and then you actually do the final assembly for the caps for the end of the quest line. Yeah. And it even comes with the uh, gems that were that were left over from the startup from the startup sale of the crown. Right. And so they incorporate those gems into the into the gift, which the Sultana is absolutely thrilled by. Which is a really nice, nice mm-hmm. gift, and I think it's a really sweet quest line. It is a very wholesome quest line, and it definitely um, is very sweet in that regard. To be honest, I think my favorite of the Goldsmith ones is probably the second one, where the two uh, music boxes... Oh, the two music boxes played together and bring out a third song. Yes. Yeah, yes, that one, is, that one is very nice, and I do have my own headcanon for... Um, for that married couple, because it goes into, it's the only time we've seen a Rogadin married couple without kid, and so that gives me ideas for, yeah. uh, for my, for my Hrothgar's OC lore. Um, on top of that, the only thing, so I think I've accomplished most of what I set out to do. Um, I've done basically a little bit of grinding on my own, mostly just because of the, um, event and for the tombstones right um which is it's actually a good incentive to grind right um what the only thing that i'm planning to do that maybe i haven't discussed about yet is i plan at some point doing a an alt character just to see what it would be like having learned everything that i know now if i how i would change my approach to arr and see if that changes how my feelings about it because i feel like Part of the problem when we before we started this project was that I didn't have a I didn't have a computer that was reliable enough to play fourteen. Right. I did not have a reliable setup for how to map my buttons, and I very much because this was really my first um, MMO. A lot of things which probably people picked up on much faster. I did not know how or why they did these things, and I probably wasn't the best at explaining it. Yes, other than you do this for this reason. And it's like, well, I don't, I would, and I wasn't approaching it with the right mindset about, okay, um, how to, taking the time to actually sit down and do it. Right. But I feel like now having at least gone through enough, uh, oh, that was the other thing that I actually, we, I've started, um, the dome and reconstruction. Oh, you also started that. Yeah. Yes. That, that was part of patch, uh, 4.3 that got unlocked. So, uh, I started dome and he- reconstruction i understand that it's not the most difficult thing because by this point um a lot of people actually will sell um their allegan uh uh allegan coins allegan coin pieces which is very convenient because they basically are pound for pound for for gil for gil which then get boosted by your gratuity as you progress through the quest line yeah, so, so you actually get a little bit more back for it. Yeah, and, and quite a few people usually either sell them at, at or under value. So, yeah. it's, so it's, a, it's a steal without having to overthink it too much. Yeah, and also you have retainers, which if you do that, put them on the long, the 18-hour one, you come back to check on them, they come back with elegant pieces. That they do, which also helps with that. So I'm basically going through um, the reconstruction. I'm basically going through Dillman Reconstruction slowly and surely. Um, since it's a weekly cycle and those are easier to keep track of than the dailies, I probably will actually complete it maybe by the time that I finish Shadowbringers or I'm at least partway through Shadowbringers. You should, if you're, if you're, if you're keeping up with it once a week, if you manage to do the full, full donation once a week, you'll get done with it in 
probably like a month or two. I think it's te- I think it's the final goal, if I remember correctly, when I looked at it, is two hundred thousand GP. Yeah. Okay. And I believe you, you, I believe it gets increased for a little bit because I believe at the end you're able to donate about forty thousand. Okay. Yeah. So I believe your the amount of gratuity you can donate increases over time okay so then it's sh- so then uh, you maybe so i don't think it'll be a month because this is week two for me all right and so maybe so, two months. so maybe two months but i do think that i it, sh- it should be on track it won't take me that long it, w- it certainly won't be like freaking um it won't be like the uh amalja quest line which i've been meaning to do and still haven't gotten around to finishing oh yeah i should mention that i finished every single beast tribe quest line no no you can't use the b word anymore oh right what do we call them now society quests that's a good right tan oh shut up (laughs) i'm sorry it started off as beast tribe quest when i joined no 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 it was originally beast quests then it became tribal quest no beast man quest then it became Tribal Quest. Now we live in a society. Yes. <laughs> it's so fucking stupid. I was fine with the Tribal Quest. Well, you know why they decided to change that. Well, yeah, they changed it because by Shadowbringers, you had dwarves who were basically Lalafels. Yes. Well, also because of the fact that, again, it, it's, it's a, it's a um, nativist thing. It's, so. a, it's a nativist thing, and it was one perpetuated by the Ulda monitorists. Yes. Calling them beast tribes and keeping them out of the out of the cities. And well, stuff. they were beasts originally, and then beast men, so beast tribes, and so it's like, okay, fine, we've now them as a part of society. Don't worry, that actually comes to a front, to to a head in Endwalker. Mm, that'll be good to know. Yeah, um, that which we're, then we're, makes the the earlier beast tribe quests seem a little odd. So let me go ahead and just ask you, just so that we have context. So I know Amalja. Ixal, Moogles, um, Vanath, Vanu Vanu. Uh, okay, um, so for ARR, yes. it is the Amalja. The Amalja and, and the Ixal. The Amalja, the Ixal, the Sylphs. Sylphs. The Sahagin. Sahagin. And the Kobolds. And the Kobolds. Okay, so five. Yeah, and those are relatively easy to do. If if you just actually, focus... Actually, probably what I need to do is I need to do all of, start all of them. Yeah. And then do all of them because that way it, that doing that line will do will be my week. Yeah. And if I do that, that might end up speeding it up a bit more. Yeah. So do so those five are AR. Yeah. And then in Heaven's Ward, you have the Vanu Vanu, Vanu Vanu, and the, the Vath, Vath and the, the Moogle. and the Moogle. Yeah. For the for for a refresher, the Ixel are the Crafter quests, the yes. Crafter and Gatherer, mm-hmm. which also do normal PvP. Normal. Uh, so sometimes you have to actually fight the monsters. So. It's all three. Okay. Uh, Moogle is the crafters. And then for Stormblood, it is the Ananta, mm-hmm. the Kojin, the Kojin, and the Namazu. Yes, I know. I, I think I was working through unlocking the Namazu. I have the quest line for the Kojin, and then I think I, I know for a fact I started the, um, the Ananta. Yeah, because you did the thing with the, the, uh, with the Mikote. Yes, so th- those three are, so those three are there, um... So I just need to get into the rotation because you said Endwalker, all of them have sort of a point to it. Well, not really, not really. At, when you beat, when you when you get them all to Sworn, mm-hmm. or at least an ARR trusted. ARR is trusted, the rest are Sworn. The rest are Sworn. You have a special quest to capstone them, and they all become Blood Sworn. Okay. So I, what I'm saying for Endwalker is that the beast tribes come into play. Okay. The, it doesn't really matter if you've done the beast tribe quests or not. Okay. It's just that they come into play. Okay, so this is not a situation of of sort of like what we were discussing before about you need to go ahead and do um, uh, Automata before you get into the Shadow for, uh, Shadowbringer raids. Yeah. Okay, it's not that situation. Yeah. But it would still be nice. It would still be nice. Okay. If only because you get a sense of self-gratification. Okay, yeah, and self gratification after that level of masochism is probably appreciated. Yeah, um, but anyway, I finished the ARR quest lines, which uh, it capstones with a horrible Makote, who's basically trying to capture all sorts of uh, members to try to turn them into who who has been recruited by a member of the not not the syndicate, but but one of the monetarists of Ulda. Who's trying to turn beastmen into living zombies of the undead 
to, to try to overtake the world. Did we not learn from, from Hildebrand? I know. I, if he, okay, first and off. And the reason why they're using Beastmen is because no one cares about if the Beast Tribes are dead or not. Did we... Did we not learn from ARR? I know. Uh, I, I feel like... I feel like... It, it's, it's, I don't... And I'm, I'm, I'm making presumptions <laughs> here. But presuming that the Garleans are not going to be a thing anymore because it kind of feels like th- they kind of won't be a thing in Endwalker. They kind of will be and won't be a thing in Endwalker. I, I feel like we need to go back and deal with the Monitors because it feels like everything is going to fuck up. It, it started with the Monitors. It should end with the Monitors, you know? I know. I know what you mean. I mean, I would still love to see Lorito's head on a pike. Ah, that would be asking for too much. But... Um, I think we can we can uh, we can find some common ground. Perhaps uh, perhaps serve alongside some Namazu. <laughs> ah, fish and chips. <laughs> yes, of course. Um, I think that covers basically everything I've done. Um, as far as my goals going forward, it's going to be finishing up Astrologian Machinist, uh, looking into getting an alt and seeing what that's going to require as far as an effort wise. But I imagine because the alt, so I, so I, uh, let me talk about the alt real quick. This alt was going to start off as a thief. Yeah. And everyone who's pro- who actually who's pro- who has actually made an alt is laughing at me right now. Yeah, because you can't start uh, uh, can't start being a thief until you beat ARR. No, not until you beat ARR. You need to at least be level ten. Yeah. You cannot select it as an origin jump. Yeah, you can't select it. As why? An <laughs> because fuck you. That's why. So well, you, for, well so I, you actually I will tell you why. Thief became a thing, got introduced post ARR. So did Lancer. Not really. Lancer was a thing in ARR. Dragoon was a, a thing until post ARR. What? I don't. I don't. I think say things though. I. I'm. I might be saying bullshit, but because my understanding, because that was the thing. My understanding was was that they what the original system was is they were yeah. Go ahead and look this up. My understanding of the original system was is you had to pick the base job, and then once you hit level 30, we gave you your job crystal. And the initial plan was you would swap out different job crystals, but you'd have the same base job. They eventually found out this was nonsense because um, because most all the jobs they added didn't really have a back one. So they that's why all the jobs going forward had level 30 as a requirement. Yeah, Rogue and Ninja was a delayed class, but it came out in AR. So every so Dragoon was a thing in in AR. Okay, so Dra- so Dragoon was a thing. It's just that they changed the the story thing for it because of what happened with Heaven's Word. Right. Okay. So that was sort of my that was kind of ups that that was kind of the thing that upset me was the fact that you cannot start as a thief. Meaning I have to pick another class, grind that up to 10, and then I can play as the class that I want to, to mess around with. And I recommend you start with something in Limsa first. Well, and that was the thing, because what jobs are in Limsa? Uh, there's, uh, there's Arcanist. Arcanist. There is Warrior. Warrior. And... Thief! But you thief. can't pick Thief at the start! No. So, Limsa is technically the worst starting place, because that's you have... Little to no job variation. Yeah. The Arcanists are interesting because it does eventually become two, but it starts out as one. Yeah, it, you either go to Scholar or Summoner, and the, no matter which one you level up, you level, level up, up the, other, the other one. Which is bizarre to me, as far as, like, job. that seems like job bias. It is a little bit job bias, but hey, I got a free healer class that allowed me to go through all the role quests. Because it's the only one that, it's the only job that they ever were able to pull off that that was the entire point of the job crystal was that you could have leveled up a job but then it would have multiple applications yeah but that was the only one they ever realized that with none of the other ones have that no they don't have that and i never think will they never will because they did not like how that worked out yes so eh. I, i'm wondering what that would be like in the world where we had that like like a different version of dragoon like, or something well no what it would mean is that dark <laughs> Imagine this is the world in which Dark Knight is a is an offense is a uh, is a DPS class. That's what that is. I mean, it pretty much is. I mean, it pretty it, it is wearing bl- it is a red class in blue clothing. Mm-hmm. So I mean, you could also say the same about Gunbreaker, which is three DPS in a trench coat. <laughs> 
Uh, but seriously, that that's probably where I would say the, the line gets drawn. And really, Bard should also be... Because Bard is a healer in a, in a, in a DPS trench coat, too. There should be another version of Bard. Like, there should be, like, a sniper class. Oh, you know, maybe a machinist. Or, yeah, or a crossbow that, class. That would have that would have been that would have been the burgeoning point was to make machinist a subclass of Bard. That would that would have probably pissed off all the machinists out there, but that would be the way that you would implement that. I mean, fair enough. But, anyway, but then Dancer would be the odd one out. Yeah, but Dan- Dancer didn't come out then because it came out later. Anyway, we're getting off topic. My rant aside. Um, I need to rework to see what my devotion to that would be in terms of an investment. My main plan is to still, once I hit Endwalker, I am going to power level Warrior and put that kind of pain on me to see how long that's going to take. All right. That's your prerogative, but we'll see how that goes. Anyway, we should actually get into the meat of this podcast other than us faffing about. Which means we have to start with faffing about. As in (laughs) even further Hildebrand adventures. So, um, it starts off with, with us encountering a very creepy little Lalafell. No, it starts us encountering a joke. Which is funny because this is, again, the further adventures of Hildebrand. So, do you want to talk about this guy first? Um, because I think we've mentioned him in the past, but I don't think we've actually uh, mentioned him in too much detail. You mean the uh, stalker? Yes. So... As I mentioned before, I don't know if I've mentioned it on the podcast, but I do recall having mentioned it to Leo before. If I did say it in the podcast, then there you go. But from uh, Heaven's Ward onwards, uh, Nashu has a little bit of a Lalafell and Stalker. Yes, and I believe that this character was in the original, but he was always as a uh, he was always an Easter egg. He would always show up in the background. Of whatever scene that involves Nashu. Yes. But from Heaven's from Stormblood onwards, he becomes more and more prominent. Yes. And so if you hadn't been looking out for him before, he literally is brought to you front and center and is the start of the quest line and asks you to t- keep an eye out on Nashu for him. Yes. Uh, of course, we do run into Nashu, who... It ma- was about to get conned by our favorite, uh, Namazu. Who, we, who I was very eager to go ahead... And, and serve up rotisserie style, considering he had he had no pants to be taken. Yes. Also, um, this is the start of, ver- of various instances of me threatening people with either bodily injury or loss of pants. I mean, you got the stealer of pants from stealing them from an old man in, in Heaven's Ward, Hildebrand. Yes, but it's it, it feels mildly appropriate, even in later sequences that we will talk about, in which that threat is still valid. Yes. But I digress. We go ahead and save Nashu from getting conned by our our least favorite fish fry and go ahead and help her investigate where the inspector has gone. She figured he may have landed somewhere in Kugane, given the trajectory of uh, of his mother's uh, skillet swing. Uh, and we do find him being sold at auction. As a statue. Yes, so apparently someone uh, excavated Hildebrand and mistook him for uh, some kind of Eorzean statue and proceeded to sell him at market. Yeah, we should also mention that we've also bumped into a few characters before that, uh, namely the uh, the merchant Akebono and the Ronin Shigure. Yes, Akebono is, um, for all intents and purposes, Hancock if he was voiced by Waluigi. Complete with mustache. Remind me, we get that mustache at the end of this quest line? No, 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 no. You have to buy that off the market, uh, off the online store. Ah. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. But you do, but you do encounter Shigure, who is a Ronin for hire, who's basically looking for, looking for his next big break. He's basically trying to get into the Seki Segumi and therefore trying to stop the notorious Wolf Burglar, which has been targeting rich and powerful merchants and so we use that to go to the auction where we find hildebrand and unfortunately we have to bid for him in order to get his freedom uh which involves putting up 10 million gil yeah pretty much and until akebono uh offers one million koban uh which goes ahead and basically busts us yeah but uh, fortunately, or unfortunately, the wolf burglar does strike, 
And uh, steals Hildebrand. And steals Hildebrand, requiring us to go out, chase down the wolf burglar, and liberate our investigator friend. We follow them to the Isle of Beko, to which Nashu immediately throws a Dongo-style series of bombs his way. Which, ex- which actually works not only... F- which not only... One, awakens the inspector, but two, frees him from being caught by the wolf burglar. Yes. Um, we're given an option to save the inspector or the wolf burglar, and we are forced to choose the inspector. We, I guess we'll save the inspector. And then Nashu says, no, let's get the wolf burglar. To which Hildebrand, saddened, let's go, turn, flips upside down. And drills himself into the ground, in the, legs spread apart. In the same pose that he was holding the entire time he was a statue. Yes. Nonetheless, um, the wolf burglar... We, he escapes on a hawk. We, yeah. we don't know his name. It's just the Kugane wolf burglar. Right. We don't know his name yet, but we do get reunited with the... Um, inspector. Inspector, who agrees to go ahead and uh, help out uh, our uh, Shigori. Shigure, yes. She goes ahead and help, agrees to help out Shigure since we did let the wolf burglar escape. Yes, but first he has to go out and help a Kikern who, who was... Uh, ki- Whose friend was auctioned off also at, he, the, at the market. Yeah, to be sold off as, as flesh to be eaten. Because apparently they... Um, they believe it's a yokai that can give immortality. Right, more specifically they're referencing the old mermaid myth. Yes. We take care of that. The the auctioneer gets arrested by the uh, by the Seki Segumi. The Seki Segumi berate uh, Shigure for letting the wolf burglar escape. Yes, and then we begin the next chapter, in- which, which basically we find out that uh, Akibono is still being threatened by the wolf burglar, and now is threatened to have a very rare katana uh, that came into his possession being stolen. The Saburo Sukahiro. Uh, so basically, he goes ahead, in order to. We basically want to be in there when the moment happens. Uh, but here's the catch: uh, Akibono is supposed to meet with the captain. Is supposed to be meeting with someone at a uh, brothel, and his guard is under strict orders to not let anyone in but Geisha. In, in, uh, in Geisha, so we have to go uh, using some connections from. Um, from Shigure, we do find a we do find a a madame who is willing to loan us a kimono. Kimono, but we have to go ahead and pay for it. To which Hildebrand says, "I have I have studied your hanging cultures, and I've heard that shaving one's head is uh, considered uh, uh, worthy enough to be considered a trade." Even. To which he goes ahead and butchers Shigure's top knot and makes him bald. bald. Well, I should I should mention Nashu is the one who does it, dressed as Jandelaine, our our aesthetician. Aesthetician, of course, filled with with the full theme and everything. Yes, uh, the Madame is so amused at this hilarity, she goes ahead and gives uh, uh, turns over the kimono for free, provided to, we return it. Yeah, at which Nashu dresses up and she enter, enters. And then we see a Final Fantasy X reference. Yep, Yojimbo's back. Yep. Te- yeah. Technically, this is our first time encountering him. Well, it's technically our second, second time, time because I forgot to mention I had Leo do a dungeon before this. Yes, yeah, so there is a, what is it? It's K- a... Kugane Castle. It's a patch dungeon, is it not? It's actually, it's... It's it's the dungeon that, that comes out as soon as you beat Stormblood. Okay. It's one of the level uh, 70 dungeons. Right, but it, it's not part of the patch quest is what I mean. It's not part of the patch quest yeah, at so, all. So, 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 so we have a standalone dungeon in which we have your first story encounter with Yojimbo. Yes. It, uh, and I say story encounter because Yojimbo does show up as a... Uh, as a First, hourly event. Hourly event in the Gold Saucer. In the Gold Saucer, in which you basically have to dodge his patterns while ta- stealing as much MGP as possible. Yeah, so technically it's our third encounter with Yojimbo. Yes. I wonder if the Slice is Right came after this. We would have to look that up later. Um, but anyway, Yojimbo is bodyguard for Akimono, who is meeting with a very notable influence person. Yeah, who is also sleazy as all fuck. And they're basically having... Uh, chats about money and power in front of in front of women as you do, and uh, Nashu comes in being 
graceless as fuck, and immediately starts nomming all the sushi, uh, which definitely makes, which is definitely suspicious to the two men who know how geisha are supposed to act. And then, in comes Hildebrand, in geisha makeup, as a taiko mochi. And goes ahead and proceeds to charm the pants off of Yojimbo, who wrote this script! I know, I know, it's so fucking ridiculous. By the way, I should mention, taiko mochi are male geisha. To Actually, there, yeah, I forgot, there's an entire line in which Akimono literally says... Look, I don't mind you. You are fantastic, but I am not in the mood for for a male geisha today. Maybe tomorrow. Which, by representation, is good, but I was not expecting it like this. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, um, <laughs> so in the middle of everyone taking psychic damage for various reasons, uh, the wolf burglar makes his move and steals the katana back. A smoke bomb goes off. Chaos ensues, and Hildebrand finds his head. Shoved into uh, a table with uh, with sake cups covering his eyes. Yes, and Shigure with a sushi on his bald head. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, nonetheless, uh, the party is very concerned about going after uh, the Kugane Wolf Burglar, and therefore we resolve to team up with Yojimbo for at least the time being to try and get the k- uh, katana back. Who is actually very confused about the fact when Hildebrand revealed himself to be the gentleman extraordinaire. Yes. I, I'm so confused right now. Which is going to be even more confusing when we get later into the storyline. But anyway, that's 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 spoilers. Um, so we go ahead. He goes out to the Ryukyu Islands uh, in the Ruby Price. And we go ahead and hunt him down with... Um, well, we find out that he's somewhere in, in uh, Doma. Well, eventually we find out through the help of his loyal hound that he's in Doma somewhere. We chase him down into... Uh, the ruined district, and we team up with um, Yojimbo's dog. Yes. Who goes ahead and attempts to sniff out, and then he's immediately bright. Bright with a single koban, thrown the opposite direction, and he just runs off for it. Yep. That that dog loves gold. Well, I mean, he trained him, uh, Yojimbo trained him well, a little too well, unfortunately. To which the Kugani wolf burglar tries to escape on his hawk, I should mention this entire time, Hildebrand is still wearing the makeup. Yes, and has not changed yet. So the bird is flying in. Hildebrand woos the bird. He does the heart emoji. The heart flies up to the bird, and the bird faints and drops into the ground. To which everyone is confused by this, but it leaves the Kugani wolf burglar with little, uh, little recourse for escape. Which we capture the wolf burglar and reclaim the Tsukihiro... To which Yojimbo says he will gladly take it back to his master. So we go ahead and resolve to go ahead and turn in the wolf burglar, uh, which go which does give some small measure to Sugure as he is allowed to try out with the Seki Segumi. Yes. Uh, so they go ahead and take the wolf burglar into custody. To which Akebono comes in saying, where the hell's my sword? To which... Everyone realizes that Yojimbo has kept the sword for himself and absconded with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, unfortunately, this uh, this course of re- th- this path of recourse has left the party in unfortunate disarray, and the matter of uh, the set of the sword being re- uh, returned uh, will prevent um, Shigure from being considered a full member of the Seki Sekun. I should also mention earlier on when we were trying to hunt down Hildebrand. One of the gentle dead man shows up in a wolf costume oh, yes. to help lead us to Hildebrand. Which causes some concern because people initially mistake him for the wolf burglar. Yes. Uh, that being said... He, do- a- he does show up again at this point. Yes, and so he his services are also used. So um, initially the, the line of thought is that the wolf burglar must have... Mu- there must be something else known about the wolf burglar. Go ask the townspeople about it, to which the townsfolk explain to you that the wolf burglar is seen as a is a folk hero he's a robin hood-esque character yes and so uh, and many times that he steals things he's stealing to sell and then give the benefits to the poor which is quite honorable and makes akebona look sleazier with every second right and of course the seki sigumi are still treated as dogs of the nobility rather than an actual police force pretty much um nonetheless it does uh, shigori sort of it's eventually decided that they need a thief to track down 
uh, Yojimbo. And so they actually go ahead and ask the uh, Kugane Wolf Berker for help. Which he doesn't, he doesn't offer unless he can, can get out. And the Seki Segumi is not going to do that without a lot of paperwork. So they resolve to smuggle him out with solving two problems at once. First, by restoring the restoring Shigure's hair v- by, by using the same tonic used in the original Hildebrand, which comes out to the same effect of a brilliant radiance, in which um, the gentle, uh, gentle, uh, the gentle dead man uh, disguises himself as a wolf, disguise and swaps places with the Kugane wolf burglar, taking his place in the jail cell while they go ahead and walk out blinded by Shiguri's brilliance. I should mention, Shiguri started off with uh, gray hair at the start. He's blonde now. No, he was brown hair now. He's he's blonde. Now, brown now blonde, yes. Yeah. Because so, he has the same hair as the old man. Yes. So, um, they go ahead and we sneak out um, the wolf burglar who goes ahead and shows us uh, where the sort of the riffraff hang out in Kugane. And we basically find out through them that if he's going to go ahead and make a move, he's going to be trying to go ahead and do it. Um, well, basically, if if the sword is not being sold on the market, then that means Yojimbo is a sword collector. So he'll be going after an even more priceless sword, which is the one that summoned Susano. Right. So we're, we're anticipating a, a, a theft from the vault again, uh, the vault of the Kojin again. Yes. So we make our way out to the Ruby Sea, to which we find Daigoro, the dog, mm-hmm. and who immediately falls in love with uh, Hildebrand, pretty much. Again? He falls in love with Hildebrand because he's made of money. Ah. Uh, he's, no, he's, he's nobility. He's wealth. Right, that is true. That yeah. is very true. To which we use this, uh, this, this fact to threaten... Yojimbo with holding Daigoro hostage with tummy rubs in, if he, in order to get this, the, the sword back. Correct. We get the sword back. Uh, Hildebrand steps on Daigoro's tail, gets chased across the Ruby Sea, running over water, to which they are. he is then buried in the dirt. Once again. Yeah. Uh, the Seki Segumi show up, and the Wolf Burglar escapes. Wolf Burglar escapes, and now they basically hold Shigure accountable, which is not looking good for him. Yeah, he's basically going to be tried and... Executed. Executed, or should I say commit seppuku. Right. And this is where the final part of the uh, chapter kind of starts. So we have to go ahead and return back to try and stop um, uh, Shigure from undergoing this ritualistic suicide. Uh, They managed to go ahead and as we're about to get there and he's about to do it, the wolf burglar does show up. And turns himself in. And turns himself in, buying him a little bit more time since the sword is still missing. Conveniently, um, Godbert is in town as he is working out something with the Ratzat Han merchants. Right. And so we also notice at this point that despite things seemingly working out resolved, the... Uh, leader of the Seki Sekumi, who turns out to be the the sleazy man that was talking with Akebono back at the Geisha house, um, refuses to listen to us and basically considers the matter dropped. Which we aren't going to hold that down. To which then we also get a message from Yojimbo, a, a writ of challenge. He wants to challenge Hildebrand to a duel. Well, that's what Hildebrand oh, or, or, thinks. Or he thinks it's for him. It turns out it's for us. Yes, which gives us the trial of Kugane Ohashi. Which turns out to be that good old Yojimbo is actually Greg. Greg Gilgamesh. Isn't that a lovely reveal? So, does that mean that Greg was the has attractions for Hildebrand? That, <laughs> pretty much. Well, he misses... He was deceived. This has so many more questions, and I, I, we do not get any answers. Nonetheless, we ki- we kick. Uh, uh, gr- uh, Gil- Actually, I should talk about ask you. What did you think of the trial? Trial itself was great, but I mean, it was. I remember we had, I had just done the uh, Kugane Castle fight, so this one was was in again similar vein, very fun nonetheless. It had some callbacks to the Susano fight, some fights to his fight, so. All in all, it's still very. It's a very nice uh, homage to uh, the first time you fought Greg. Yeah, which 
which is pretty good. There's also a shell game as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, uh, after you kick his ass, Greg offers his hand in help with uh, Hildebrand and everything to try to stop what's going on. Yes. And so we mentioned, we mentioned the issue of the glowing eyes uh, to Godbert, who, expl- who uh, we get conversations with the Rats at Hand merchant, who mentions that basically there's a synthetic drug that can be made which has basically mind control powers. It is called Duprism. And that the Duprism may be the reason why Akebono has such a powerful hold over the captain of the sect, Sigumi. To which we try to follow uh, Akebono out to... to the Ruby Price, where he's supposed to have a meeting with Godbert, and Ratzatan basically were, uh, dosed Godbert with uh, Do Prism to basically make him the best artisan at no cost higher to Akebono. Pretty much, to in further empower him. We go ahead and try to intervene, but this is Godbert we're talking about. No one stands a chance against him. No, pretty much. He goes he goes go, uh, Goldsmith LB3 on everyone's ass and drives them all into the ground. Except for... Hildy. Hildy, who, ha- who has to go ahead and try and bring out one of his fa- own father's moves on him. Which actually does wake him up, to which Godbert does the reverse Manderville meteor dive. Yes. It's, and once again, hands his, uh, plans, oh boy, that's, that's some, plows his son into the ground and then go, gets up to go deal with the rats at hand merchant Nakebono. Well, actually, while he was, uh, while he was under mind control, he, and Akebono said, take, lay waste to everyone. Yeah. He shouldn't have said everyone because he got his ass handed to him while he was, uh, while Godbert was under mind control. You cannot control a Manderville man. Apparently not. However, the Rats at Hand merchant had at least one final trick up his sleeve, and that was to attempt to void sense summoning. As in, basically, he mind-controlled uh, Greg to try to escape. Yes, and in doing so, pulls Nashu and uh, Hildebrand into a void. Yes. Um, Godbird is fine and ended up uh, subduing the Rats at Hand merchant and making sure they never do business with the... With the with the uh, well, the Razan Hand Merchant ended up escaping with them. He actually shows up. Okay. In, then then Akebono. Yeah, he ends up apprehending Akebono, who actually brought the the sword with him. To which we didn't mention this before, but the Wolf Burglar took wanted to steal the sword because it belonged to his father, basically. Yes, he, he, the, his adopted father. Yes, he was a, he was an or- orphan who was taken in by a. Uh, samurai who basically sold the sword in order to go ahead and put food on the table for them. And he eventually got the sword back and was going to place it on his grave before it ended up getting stolen and sold at, at market. Yes. So that was the entire reason for his emphasis. And again, goes back to what the people were saying about corruption and the and, and justice and everything. Yes. To which we give the sword to the uh, wolf burglar and Shigure says... I will just have to let the Seki Zegumi know that I have not seen hide nor hair of the wolf burglar. Mm -hmm. To which he calls every one of us crazy and loves us. Right. To which he then goes off. He he will still be the wolf burglar. He will still do his thing. And Hildebrand's gone. And the story draws to a close with Mm -hmm. the Manderville Mambo. Yep. Um, So, I did ask you about this. There is no... Um, Manderville questline for Shadowbringers. Correct. I will say this right now. There is a dungeon in Shadowbringers mm-hmm. in patch 5.3 where a bunch of wo- bunch of ghosts appear. One of them can be Hildebrand mm-hmm. because he's basically in the rift and he basically gets pulled, his soul gets kind of pulled out and he'll be seen out in like the group. But that's a rare instance of that happening. Okay. But he's not going to show up Again, until... Endwalker. Endwalker. Post-Endwalker. Okay. Um, I have questions. Not right now, but I have questions because of some things that get said when we do the next podcast. Okay. Um, But I will just say... I have questions about the cosmology about this world because, boy, howdy, is it getting more complicated the more we go into it. Shadowbringers will help explain a little bit of that. Okay. Um, let's go into some more cosmology because we're going to talk about the Ivelisse rates. Well, actually, first, before we talk about the Ivelisse rates, what is your overall thought on the Stormblood Hildebrand arc? Okay, so the Stormblood Hildebrand arc definitely, I think it's a bit better. 
I, I, I will really say on further hindsight, it's a bit better than Heaven's Ward. Shigori compared to Seer as your guest character definitely doesn't hold up. But upon reflection, they do a lot more callbacks to the original. They're doing. They're very much doing uh, a lot more callbacks uh, to ARR's questline of uh, the hair gimmick, the Gentle Dead uh, swapping in places. Mm-hmm. Um, well, def- the, gen- the Gentle Dead also showed up in, in Heaven's Word too. Yes, but not nearly as much of a plot point as mm-hmm. they served here. Yes, because origi- because we also when we went to go hunt the the when we went to go hunt the wolf burglar, we actually run into the Gentle Dead man dressed as a wolf before running into the actual wolf burglar. Right. So we and again, this is how we knew we were on the right track because the gentle dead can instinctively track Hildebrand's location. Right. So they do a lot more callbacks, whereas Heaven's Ward tries to tell its own story. Mm-hmm. Um, it's also um, notable since Heaven's Ward, do- since uh, Stormblood doesn't have um, Julian show up either. So it is interesting in that regard because it's more off of Hil- uh, Hildebrand and Nashu again, mm-hmm. which de- I-, I felt like. In hindsight, Julianne took a lot more of the limelight because we got to see a lot more of her personality, her her relationship with her husband and her son, as well as the overt fact that she doesn't really approve more than... I mean, both of them didn't approve of his inspecting ways, but Godbird at least had respect for him by the, by the, by the middle to late of ARR because of how he saw devoted he was to the man of real life. Yeah. Julianne was very against it for the longest time, and she was only along to see how Hildy would fuck it up. Right, only to see sort of the chaos. So she kind of also played a, a straight lady role in this entire mm-hmm. dra- in that drama. I will tell you right now, both me- both Godbert and Julianne show up for the Endwalker ones. Okay, um, I do think that um, as more of the overall plot, I and I think we got little enjoyment out of it just because. Of our characterization of Akebono being uh, Waluigi, yeah. wa- being Waluigi Hancock for our purposes, I think that made that more enjoyable for us going through it. Yeah. So, if you would have to rank ARR, Heaven's Word, and Stormblood Hildebrand, how would you rank them? I think Hildebrand is easily nine, nine and a half. Um, I would say that whether you find. I, I would say, from a story perspective, Heaven's Ward has the better story. Blood, uh, Blood, uh, Stormblood has the better jokes. Okay. That's the way I would rank it. Because while I do think that um, uh, Vivi hulking out and delivering a fucking clothesline to Matt, uh, Hildebrand is hilarious, I do felt I was laughing a lot more with the jokes on... Um, on Stormblood. on Stormblood because it was so much of a callback to ARR. Yeah. And also Sealer of Pants, that that set a meme in and of itself. I don't think there was anything in Stormblood that was original. I would say that Stormblood was more consistent in its jokes. I would say that outside of me being a wrestling fan, uh, that was the only reason that the, the clothesline uh, hits me more. Yeah. I really... I, I, I have an issue when they do old man jokes or old old people jokes in games like this because I get tired of that of that fucking humor. The Steeler of Pants thing is hilarious and I think that's that's a fantastic way to sort of make ends with that, especially given the context of 14 being an MMO. Yeah. But I think that barring those two jokes, I think everything else in Stormblood was just funnier. Alright. Fair enough. Um, in terms of an actual point grade, I would say it's an Eight and a half to Heaven's Word and an eight solid for Stormblood. And then it's going to vary depending on whether you will like the jokes more or the storyline more. Fair enough. I kind of flip-flop between uh, Heaven's Word and Stormblood. And I, and I think it's for that reason. Yeah. I will say ARR was a great introduction to Hildebrand. It really was. And, I, and we unfortunately have not gotten anything since. Let's see if Dawn Trail decides to surprise us. Yeah. And Walker, it's very hilarious. Also, get ready for your warrior of light to become a sports star. I mean, I, that doesn't surprise me, to be quite honest. I mean that in quite the literal sense, but that's that's the only tidbit I'm giving you. Okay. Um, ready so, to talk about Ivelisse. Yes. Now let's talk about Ivelisse. So, first off, have you ever played War of the Lions? Yes. I have played War of the Lions. I don't know the full... I have not played the full thing. 
I never got to really complete it, but I do know basically the story beats. I know I've done a, a wiki dive, so the plot of War of the Lions is not unknown to me. Okay, so basically, the Evil East raids is called Return to Evil East because it's basically supposed to be a continuation of the events of Final Fantasy Tactics set in Final Fantasy fourteen, and they and they literally set that up by explaining that the that Evil East was an ancient civilization from so many years ago, uh, which has its roots in uh, Garlean culture. It's basically... Um, Proto-Garlean. Proto, Proto-Garlean, for a lot of reasons that we find out later. It's also, interestingly enough, a bridge between tactics and Final Fantasy twelve. Yeah. Yeah, 12. Yeah, because I, 12 is also Ivalice. 12 is also Ivalice, and not only does it confirm it, it, at least within the context of 14's cosmology, is to be within the same universe, but also has some very interesting parallels. Yeah, because I will tell you right now, in the Boja, in Stormblo- in uh, Shadowbringers, mm-hmm. there's a lot of callbacks to uh, Final Fantasy 12 in there, mm-hmm. because you've got Ash, you've got Gabranth. You've got all sorts of stuff. You've got, hell, Fran shows, shows up in this game. Right, Fran shows up here, in fact, during this quest line. So, uh, what? how do we even start this? So this starts out as we're being recruited to assist a Garlean theater troupe. Yes. The fuck? Yeah. The Garlean theater tr- troupe was actually set up by Solus Zos Galvis, the first emperor of Garlemald, who had a th- had a pension for the dramatic. Uh, in, and, and you propaganda. will find out about that. And propaganda. And propaganda. And so, basically, the theater troupe explains that the the headman, the the troop master, is one part artist, one part historian, because not only does he uh, does he explain that one of the most popular plays. Which is based off of tactics, which is based off of tactics story. Yeah. Uh, not only is believed to be, not only is it a popular story, but it's also used as uh, basically counter propaganda against Garlean against Garlean lore. Mm-hmm. Um, so basically, he, he believe. So basically, here's what happens: the storyline of, of Final Fantasy Tactics involves this, a war of succession between two families. Correct. Uh, the um, and in that, uh, Ramza Bellevue, um, B- uh, Belove, who is our primary protagonist, has uh, works alongside his foster brother Delitia in order to go ahead and, and solve the war of succession. The story that is being told through Garlean, uh, Garlia, is that Delitia by himself throws, su- throws su- succession, and that Ramza and his sister Alma basically were tragedies of were, were, were tragedies of war. Correct. What um, the troop master believes, and this is only discovered by papers that were held by his ancestor, is that um, Ramza and Alma actually played a bigger war in the shadows, and were responsible for dealing with a a parallel to the primals, which are the Lukavi, basically preventing them from taking over the world, and basically fled to escape. Um, were basically were. Ki- Ramza died in the line of action, and Alma fled in order to continue uh, the bloodline and carry on these secrets. Yes. Carry on the bloodline, which was used to seal away the the ancient Lukavi primal Ultima. Yes, which is a very familiar name for everyone. Yes, if you've played... For, if you play, it's, it's a Final Fantasy reference. Ultima is in, almost, in quite a few Final Fantasies, mainly in Tactics... Right. But it's also shown up in sixteen if you've played that. Yes, and and is going to show up here again. But that's again where we're talking out of where we're spoiling. Um, <laughs> anyway, the uh, troop master has gone so far in order to go ahead and go, gone so hard in his devotion to search for this. Uh, he has actually named his own kids after the the ancestors Ramza and Alma. And I should say that this current Ramza is a fucking racist little prick. Well, he, he was he was very spoiled as uh, Genomis' father. Um, there's a reference for you. Yeah. Um, is is so hard set on finding the answers to the to his to the heritage that he wants to go ahead and and that that is his primary focus and almost the theater company is second to a degree. Yeah. 
And so we basically make our way to the first, the first of the of the three alliance raids, the royal city of Rabinaster, to locate and see if we could find the ancient city within the royal city. Which we are successful in doing so, and come across a Garlean soldier being reincarnated into one of the uh, ancient rulers from the time. Yeah. So first off, we encounter a few of the Lukavi, Mateus the Corrupt. Hashmal the Bringer of Order. And then we encounter something called Rotoclef. Oh, I should also mention that for the for the entirety of the Evil East race, the monster design is done by one of the artists for Shin Megami Tensei 4. Yes. As in the guy who made all the shit art. Well, they all can't be hits. Yeah, I mean, seriously, I, I remember seeing... Uh, what, what, Merkaba. Merkaba. I hated the design. Mer- Merkaba and Lucifer are the biggest attractions from SF4 style. Yeah. Although they had some real bangers, if you remember Lilith. Lilith was alright, but she had, like, pincer legs. Well, I mean, you know, if you wanted to have a Christian depiction of Lilith, I think that would be number one on the list. I mean, fair enough. That one was alright, but I forget what the artist... Minotaur. Did. Can Min- you... Re- oh, Min- yeah. Min- Minotaur's design? Minotaur's a good design. Medusa's was awful. Yeah, Medusa's was awful. Yeah. The the Minotaur design was good. What was the name of that uh that artist? Um I am not I do not remember out of the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure if you look up SMT4 design, I'm pretty sure it will tell you. The creator K- K- Keita Amen Amenia. Amemaya. Am- Amemaya. Amemaya. Yes. Oh, he's the director of the Garo TV series. What's Garo TV? Uh, Ga- the Ga- Garo is a, uh, uh, I believe it's like a Sentai thing. Oh, okay. you know those those uh, those those things that the uh, what is it? The, the 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 silver wolf armor at, at the gold saucer. Oh yes, he designed those. Oh okay, yeah. Okay, I see. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so we have to go ahead and fight. Um, Several Lukavi. Yes. And first off is Mateus the Corrupt, who basically does a whole bunch of water and ice mechanics, which I was not expecting that from Mateus, because I'm just remembering the one at, in uh, Tactics Advance who that- did a whole bunch of darkness shit. No, she ha- she was ice. She, she was, was ice? ice? Yes. Mm. But um, anyway. Um, and then we got Hashmal, who does a whole bunch of earth. Sand, earth and sand. Yes. And then... Rothkal, I... Rothkal, that's the, is is uh, rough. Uh, it's the chariot one. The chariot one, yes. Yeah, the whole the whole dungeon is pretty intense. And then we got to slay Argath Thedolphus. Argath Thedolphus, which is that's the king. Yeah, that's the king, and he's got a pretty interesting mechanic with a angel and devil mask, where you have to either if he wears the angel mask, you have to obey him. Or if he's wearing the devil mask, you have to do the opposite. Correct. And it's definitely one of the more trippier quests. Yeah. Uh, it, one of the more trickier uh, boss battles. I think it was the chariot one that was more difficult, but I think that was because we had some issues with uh, our alliance when we were running it. Yeah, that, that one can kind of fuck with people because a lot of people don't realize you have to click on the little lights when the, when the whole arena goes black. Yes. And so you have to click on the lights and select them. You can't just stand in them like like a lot of people think you can. Yes. And so at the end, uh, we managed to go ahead and get back um, the Durai papers. But unfortunately, we get held up by a bunch of Bonga Sky Pirates. Yeah, that's a thing. Yes. So apparently the Bonga exists in this world as well. As well as the Seek, because we encountered a bunch of Seek during the, the uh, Rabinaster fight. Yes. And so fighting the bong- uh the Bonga basically hold um, uh, Genomus hostage and basically end up taking the book with them. Uh, to which we go, we ha- we basically have we shake our fists in rage at them, and we're gonna have to go hunt them down later. Yeah, which then leads us to the Ritorana Lighthouse. Yes, which well, supposedly has the ancient city of Go, of go within it. Uh, before we before we go on to that, because we are skipping over a very important detail, um, one of the things that get, that is brought up again is Orosite. Yes, uh, as both Genomus and Alma have Orosite uh, tokens on them. Yeah. Um, the Orosite, as we know, is a powerful uh, stone that is used to contain... Uh, we've used it to contain Ashians, 
But, but get, that was synthetic orcite. That was synthetic orcite. Nat- even naturally occurring orcite is rare. But uh, this specific orcite that's been in the, in their possession, um, uh, this orcite is con- is somewhat dangerous because it contains um, remnants of people. And specifically, um, one of the orcites uh, possibly may be possessed by something. Yeah. And there's a lot of history about who, because Genomus is, uh, by Alma, is claimed to be talking to someone, even though no one, he's in the room whenever he's doing his research. Right. And so there's a question of undue influence, especially because we know that Orosite, if not maintained, um, can lead to uh, possession, which is how the Ashians do their nonsense. Yeah. Um, so th- that question gets involved. And uh, eventually we do manage to go ahead and find that the Banga do come to us for help because their captain has gone out to the lighthouse by himself. We also find out at this time that um, Genomus's wife was the, uh, uh, not Genomus, was it Genomus's wife? I believe so. Was a former royalty in Ravanastra. Yeah. And so... Um, the Banga themselves were actually uh, royal fusiliers who were basically tasked with making sure that she got out alive and they failed. Yeah. But um, the captain apparently has had a lot of hang-ups over this. And so he carries an oarsite on him that was once belonged to the queen. Yes, which is strikingly similar to the one that Alma has. Right. And so the, the, he, he is angry and pissed off and so he goes to um, the lighthouse, and basically everyone realizes by this point um, that if he goes there with strong emotions, he may end up setting off the Orsite. The Orsite. To which we encounter him, and he sees us as nothing but Garlean and... Uh, as Garlean soldiers. Soldiers, like Livia, Gaius. I, I think we end up actually being per- perceived as a judge. Yeah, I don't recall. Probably. I think we get perceived as like a bronze or something. Yes, because the armor design is very similar. Yeah. Uh, so none the lo- so unfortunately we are forced to go ahead and chase him down, and that leads us to the, that that goes into the Ritorana raid specifically. Yes, the first first fight of which is Famfrit, the Darkening Cloud, who who does a lot of water, who himself does a lot of water mechanics, and worst of all, he he attacks with the ultimate Gen Z attack. The Tide Pod. Yes. <laughs> uh, the next one that we fight is Bellius, who uh, does a lot of vulnerability and slow mechanics, but he is the one of fire. Yeah, he is the fire one. He basically will it will create uh, platforms, and if you see it moving really fast, it's going to activate really quickly. And then, then we get to the worst boss. Math! Possibly in the entirety, which I actually didn't have too much trouble with once I understood where the mechanics were. Yeah. So, uh, when, Construct 7. Construct 7. So when you start the, that particular phase of Construct 7, he gives you a random number. He basically I, turns your HP into that number. He gives your HP into that number, but it gives it as a buff. Yes. As, as a debuff set. And that debuff controls which, uh, whether, which one multiplied by whatever position you step into answers his question. Yeah. So basically... Do multiples of four. Do multiples of five. Do prime numbers. But make sure that your HP, when you step into the circle, or not, or not, is going to is going to modify you to the number you need to be. Bingo. Which that fucks up a lot of people. That it does. Yeah. So you can either get, doing it right gives you a slight buff against whatever he's going to do next. Failing it gives you a, a debuff. If you get two debuffs, you're basically going to get one shot by whatever move he does afterwards. Yep. And then the last one is Yazmat. 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 Which, Which, boy, howdy, that was a huge boss. That's a huge health health pool on that. Yeah. For those of you who have played Final Fantasy XII, Yazmat is known as the boss where it has such a high health bar, you can actually stop the fight midway through, go out of the arena, go to the shop... Buy a whole bunch of items and then walk back in. Yes. He actually has a buff that makes it so that his actual HP is 20% of that shown in his face. Yeah. So that's why it looks like you're doing no damage. And once he starts doing his big massive fuck you attack, you can attack the core. And attacking the core drops his health bar dramatically. Yes. 
which and also he is a bit of a rough fight if you don't know what you're doing basically uh he will activate magnets on the field and make sure you're not floating no matter what yes. what your polarity is make sure you're not floating because that will knock you out of the ring yep and that's no good yeah he is a bit of a fight because he actually moves all across the field. Mm-hmm. And I I suck tanky for that fight. Yeah, that one was that one was rough. Um so the main plot has basically been dealing with the um with I the should three... mention that that uh the Bonga turned into Yzma. Yes, and so we did have to kill him in order to free that. It's at this point that we do realize that the Orsite is dangerous, but the Orsite also has an, unaddi- has an additional unintended effect. Uh, Ramza also comes into contact with the Orsite, or a different Orsite. Yeah. And he ends up talking like old Ramza. Yes, he ends up channeling the old Ramza. Um, which causes him to be a lot more tolerant of other races for the time being. Yeah. Um, which, by the way, we forgot to mention we had two Mughal... Uh, guest appearances or Easter eggs. Oh yes, Mont Blanc and Hardy Hardy, which are characters from Tactics Advance, actually. Yes. Uh, but two, but they are done in the fourteen style of Moogle. Yes. So do not expect the 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 fancy dressers to show up. But Mont Blanc wants to become a true actor, I guess. Yes. He, he kind of he kind of is a dial a dream person who doesn't know what he wants, and so he literally. Uh, goes with the whims of whatever he possibly is inspired by at the time. Yeah. And Hurdy Gurdy's trying to keep him on, trying to stay on one path for once, for fuck's sake. Yes, because uh, he tries to become a great warrior of legend and ends up almost getting eaten for his troubles. Yes. Um, but nonetheless, um, the we have, uh, throughout the quest line, gotten contact with, um, uh, what is our dangerous bisexual's name again? Are dangerous bisexual in the, uh, the science. Uh, si- that said, uh... astrologian. Oh, Orianje. Orianje. Orianje can't be fucked to ask with us, but he has a disciple who's willing to go ahead and assist us in terms of answering any technological questions we may have. Mikoto, who is an Ara, and uh, who also seems to be slightly crushing on Sid, who keeps making the occasional appearance here and there. Right, but um. Uh, uh, Mikoto? Yes, Mikoto. Okay, because I only, because the, because unfortunately of the name, you almost want to see Mikote, but you know that's not her name. No, or Mikanko or if Mi- you're a Yu-Gi-Oh fan. Or Mikanko if you're doing that one. Anyway, uh, Monomo wants to go ahead, it basically helps us and ex- explains the science behind the Aura site, and to, one, how the possessions are happening, and two, um, how to stop them, because we are beginning to realize that Ultima is in uh, is a is going to use the aura side to bring herself back, yeah. And she's going to use the disciples of Ra- uh, the descendants of Ramza to do it. Yeah, because their blood is the thing that's binding her. So, uh, unfortunately, we try to go ahead and I think we 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 have to go confront her in the place that is strongest, which is an old cat, which is an old church. Which is actually the church where a lot of significant events happen in tactic events. Yes. However, yeah. that land is now sacred to the Vera. Yes. So it, we need to get Vera permission if we don't want to end up with a bunch of arrow holes in us. To which in comes Fran. Who is presently the leader of the Rabinastra resistance and basically initially refuses without asking for ridiculous demands out of the alliance. To which we try to uh, have a talk with Hancock and... Uh, uh, and, and, and uh, t- t- Tatar. Tatar, thank you. And, and basically, unfortunately, because of the circumstances with uh, Stormblood, they are not able to offer any support right now. Because the war with Garlemald is still going on with du- in, 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 in Alamigo, mainly. In, Alam- in Alamigo, mainly, but still dealing with recovery in Doma. So, unfortunately, they can't offer any resources, which, honestly, she did expect, but basically wanted to know whether or not you would actually tell her up front whether you would you, you would provide any support or not. And more the truthfulness of the matter was what was concerning rather than the actual outcome. So to which she then relents and agrees so and agrees to give you permission to go into the Orban Monastery. The Orban Monastery, which is where the final raid event goes. To which we enter and our first encounter is an old uh, character from Tactics, Mustadio. Uh, Mustadio, yes. 
Um, I'm just trying to remember what he looks like just because it has been a while. Um, who is di- who is one of the who is a significant character in? Um, I think I'm trying to remember what his role is because it was a little bit further and it's been so freaking long for me. Well, he's he's a gunner, that's for sure. Let me check Mustachio. Okay, you check that out. I will go ahead and explain the fight for a bit. One of his interesting mechanics is he will get up onto one of the uh, platforms outside of the, the arena, and a ring. A strange donut will appear around you with one spot uh, open. Basically, you're supposed to show your your weak point to him, ah. which is basically show the open point of the ring mm. towards him. And once that hits you, you get knocked down to like one HP. Mm-hmm. And but if you don't do that, you will actually get killed. Ah, uh, okay. See that this is why I was kind of remember. He's the he is the. Um, he is the party character for the machinist class. Ah, but he but he is the machinist who helps you work with the um, who helps you work with Construct Eight, who is what who is the robot character that references who is, who is the base for Construct Seven reference. Right. Um. So that's why he, he makes a reappearance this time as a as a robotic sniper, which is kind of cool. I liked his design. Yes. The next character, however, is one that I think um, a lot of people know. Agrius. Yes. Agrius, who is um, one of the holy knights, and who had a lot, who also had a lot of uh, story time within. That's usually the one that people remember more when they're talking about characters. Her and um, I forgot, get, uh, I forgot what his name, but the Dark Knight. Ah, but those two are the, usually the characters that come up in terms of favored ones. Yeah, her her thing is really cool. You have to either uh, claim a shield or a sword ability and toggle it. To defend against certain attacks. Yes. She will then pull in one of the alliances into a dark area that will summon ghosts, and you will have doom on you. You are supposed to defeat all the ghosts with the sword that you are given. Yes. And defeat them before your doom timer runs out. Yes, it's one of... Isn't it one of, like, the, um... Uh, the raid actions? Yeah, it's one of those raid actions. They don't get used much outside of Stormblood, I'm going to tell you that right now. Mm. That's a shame, because I actually do like that mechanic. Yeah, it is pretty cool. Uh, But yeah, she will do that. She will even uh, trap some some members of your party into crystal, and you have to break those crystals out, otherwise they will get hit by uh, lion attacks. And then, the Thunder God. Sidolphus Orlando. Yeah, this boss. Yeah. This is the one I, I, I was confusing this one with the chariot one. This is the one that was that took us forever to beat. Oh yeah, Thunder God Sid is actually sometimes people sometimes used to say that he was an extreme fight. Yeah, he's an extreme fight in a, in a in a in a hard raid. That's what he is. Yeah. To which he has very interesting mechanics. You have to go. The party has to split up into three groups, pretty much. Yes. You have to dodge his sword attacks, move in, move out. He will drop uh, expanding AoEs, and he will drop uh, spots where you have to stack up into groups of three. You know what he reminds me of? He reminds me of Ozma from. Uh, he reminds me of Ozma from the other raid series. Oh, from from uh, the ancient city of Mach. Yes. He yeah. reminds me a lot in terms of the similar frustration and style. Yeah. So. That is very much, I think, where you're going to see a lot of overlap in that design. But he was still very fun despite being the most challenging fight in the entire raid series. Yeah. To which, finally, we we encounter Ultima, the High Seraph, trapped in crystal. Yes, so she's she's a very interesting fight. Um, Lots of AoEs, lots of AoEs, lots of adds. Denizens of the Abyss, from Ink of Blackest Night, I summon you. And she does a... Uh, Ultima thing, and she, huh, she does the Ultima thing of bringing out other primals, or the Lukavi in this case, as extra attacks in her, uh, in her fight. Yeah. To which then, she starts powering up for an ultimate attack, to which we have to get into one area and get protect. Oh, what happens is the Lukavi get defeated by the ghosts of, uh, Mustadio, Sid, and Agrius. Mm-hmm. And they create a barrier to protect us from Ultima's attack. To which it then breaks out of the crystal, and you see the real crazy design of Ultima, the little monster body. Yes. Yeah, in which it tries to bash its head through the uh, the barrier. We fight it back, 
and then the ghost of Ramza appears to protect us from the final blast of it all. Yes. Into which we have to fight Ultima again at, from the beginning in a new uh, arena. In a new arena, but it's still quite a spectacle. It's definitely, I think, a fun fight, but I still think that Sid is probably the high, high, hardest part in the entire thing. Oh yeah, Sid's the hardest part, I won't deny. Another interesting thing about Ultima the High Seraph is there are certain areas where you'll see a, a, tr- a series of triangles move across. People need to get to the spot where they're going, because then the original version of Ultima, what she used to look like, the red outfit and yes. the wings, will dive down and attack. Yes. Which is pretty cool. Yes, it is. Um, but yeah, once you clear that raid series, um, the spirit of Ramza shows up and says that he is that he is satisfied, he forgives the spirit of Deletia, and um, possession ends, everyone's returned to normal, and they decide to go ahead and um, rewrite the story. Rewrite the story to have it portrayed as Ramza and Alma fleeing to start a new country elsewhere. To start on a new adventure of their own. Yes. Which is pretty nice. Again, of all the side quests in which you need to shell out for the voice actors, the one in which you literally have them sing the ending is probably one where you need to shell out the money. I know, I know. They don't really do that till Endwalker. Yeah. And oh, it, by the way, I should tell you, there's also a reason why I had you do the Evilly Straits. Okay. Because, because they come back in, in uh, the Endwalker Alliance raids. Really? Yeah. Okay. That's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. Yeah. Um, also, there's a... Um, there is an end credit scene to this quest to this quest line, in which the Garleans are moving in to the reader uh, on a light the reader on a lighthouse, and they are examining the remnants of uh, uh, Construct Seven. Seven. Yes, which okay, that's got some interesting implications, and it has implications for future for the um, for the patch quest coming up. Possibly, yeah. I believe this stuff leads into. I believe all that stuff is supposed to lead into Boja because that. Because doing the Evil East Alliance raid was required in order to do the Boja Ah. instance. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, so So, what did you think of uh, the Evil East Alliance raids? The Evil East Alliance raids were interesting. I had a lot of, I had a lot more memories with them than I do with the presence, uh, with the ones that we just did not too long ago, which is Omega. We'll talk about that one next episode. Yeah. But um, I had a lot more memories with this one, especially with uh, the music and the bosses. So even though I, the, my memories are a little bit foggy, uh, I definitely remember a lot more of the characters um, here, and they actually were replicated very nicely in comparison to um, how I felt about at least most of the bosses for the Omega Raids. Um, in terms of the storyline, I felt that it was kind of weird... Yeah, I won't deny it. The storyline for Evelys is mm, shaky at best. Yeah, I mean, they all can't be, you know, pi- uh, pirate pirate quests to hunt for uh, pirate treasure hunt turns a wall uh, a wall bandit is dog fighting quests. Yeah, with um, with Kate she Kate she having their own uh, uh, head butting match with the pirate captain. So I thought that was very interesting. Yeah. It, I, I, I'll, I'll be, comp- I'll be completely honest. I find the Evil East Alliance raids to be my least favorite of the Alliance raids. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm just going to flat, flatly slay it out. Whenever it procs up, when I have to do the Alliance raids, I viscerally groan. Okay, I think that for me, I... although to be honest, I think I dislike the near raids about as much. But that's only because the bosses in the near raids are HP sponges. So that's. What I was going to say to my to to its defense, I actually prefer those raids more than I do. Um, I prefer the story from Heaven's Word, the 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 void set the void arc void arc story. Hate the raids. Hate the story for Return to Evilies. Love the raids. Fair enough. So I so I think that that kind of balances it out for me. It still leagues better than Crystal Tower. Crystal Tower, although I'm imagining. Crystal Tower is going to make a lot more sense for me post-Shadowbringers. 
Yeah, because Shadowbringers Shadow is basically the uh, expansion where they made the Crystal Towers mandatory. Yes, and, and it becomes relevant because it builds on a lot of what you've done earlier. And again, it makes the Heaven's Ward Alliance raids and... Yeah, he- no, the Heaven's Ward's... I forget what it's called for Alexander. Oh, the Alexander raids. Yeah. What it makes what it makes the Alexander raids and the Omega raids relevant. Yeah, it makes the Alexander and the Omega raids relevant, especially once you do the twinning. Yes. Anyway, um, I think we've gone ahead and faffed about for two hours now. Do you want to start talking about uh, patch quests? Yes. Let's go ahead and make this three hours. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> we are we, so we just finished kicking um, Zenos out of the capital of the capital. And we're set on reconstruction efforts. Yeah. To which are involved our fellow uh, member of the Scions and Echo user says, you want to go on an adventure? And it's like, sure, I could use some downtime. And to which basically he explains that there's a rumor that the Mad King basically buried most of his dosh because he was afraid of other people getting at it. And had literally not only his family members killed, but then their spirits contained via necromancy in the tomb with him. Mm-hmm. That's dark. Yeah, and so we get the help of Alpha Note to come with us to help explore the area un- in the locks underneath the Salt Lake, and basically that triggers the first dungeon of the ex- of the patch quest, the Drowned City of Scala. Which it's very interesting. It's it's definitely an unusual quest line. Yeah, and so the first dungeon, it's not my favorite. I'll be honest. Yeah, it doesn't have too much besides just the the scent of a glorified treasure hunt. But it is one of the few instances in which you get to go ahead and have um, you can have NPCs with you if you do, if you don't want to do it with a party. Yeah, well, you can do a lot of the uh, you can you can from now on you can do all the dun all the mandatory ma- mandatory dungeons with party members. Uh, with that, with trusts, is with trusts, yes, duty trusts. Yeah, um, but yeah, so you managed to go ahead and clear out. I'm trying to remember what the 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 end boss's gimmick is. Oh, the end boss's gimmick is that it do, it'll do forward beams and mm-hmm. tail swipes. It will cause puddles to appear and donuts around certain party members, and you have to position so everyone's inside the donut or someone's outside causing an AOE. Mm-hmm. He can do a lot of stuff. I remember liking the design of that boss because mm. he's fucking uh, furry bait. Mm. <laughs> Still, it, oh yeah, I do remember calling you out for that one while we were raiding it. So yes, that is true. Yeah. Um, but we do manage to secure the treasure, which will definitely help making rebuilding and, and recovery efforts much easier. Yeah. However, in doing so, we come across one of the lingering threads from the main story. Which is for Dola, namely all the people wanting the butcher's blood. And so, um, Lee tries to go ahead and calm their rage, but a lot of people are still very upset. And only calm down when Raoban when, shows when up. When Raoban shows up, gives a rousing speech, and gets them to go ahead and stand down for now. To which then, we get a visit to see Fordola in her in her prison cell. And we find out that her echo is a little... Spotty. Spotty. In the fact that it'll trigger whenever she's near anyone and everyone, meaning that she gets to see the weight of her sins constantly. Yes, and we also get the full backstory for Fredola as well. Meaning that she was a member of Alamegan... She, she was part of Alamegan upper, a society that had been uh, slowly... Uh, that was set to be assimilated by the Empire. Yeah, they were trying to become members of the Garlean Empire. Right. And it didn't end well because a disgruntled Alamegan basically cursed her parents for being blood traitors. Uh, she ran off into the market, ended up getting, uh, was going to be stoned by a crowd, and her father steps in, uh, getting stoned to death in her place. And the mom tried to get the garlians to step in and they basically said and eh, let them let them sort it out which is kind of fucked up yeah that resentment led to fordolo basically wanting to join the military uh outright and the reason why she got the face tattoo is because the face tattoo was the mark that her father had and so she always wanted to carry her father's legacy with her and so we we get that and it further impl- explains that basically we we can we only get it if we need 
it's regulated. We don't just tap into people's memories all the time. Ordola basically can't control it. It was never part of her design, and I guess... It's probably because she was the first test subject. And, uh, well, I was going to say that. I don't think Xenos is immune to it. I think Xenos just doesn't care. Yeah, I think it doesn't affect him. Because, remember, Xenos already was fucked up to begin with. So by the time that he injected himself with it, it didn't bother him because he already didn't... He didn't see... He wouldn't... He is so emotionally numb. And that's, again, part of his battle mania. Is that he wouldn't care to see what others thought of him or other people's plights. He just saw them as beneath him. Yes, pretty much. And I should mention that Fordola's resonance only appears in one eye. Xenos is in both eyes, so that tells you that his is more perfected. Right. So maybe he could control that a lo- the Echo a lot better, yeah. which is actually how he could possess Shinryu. Right. But regardless, Fordola complains about seeing all this stuff, and then she gets a glimpse of our memories. And she's like, Holy shit. How are you still standing? How can you keep going? Push-ups, sit-ups, and plenty of juice. For those who have lived, for those who we can yet save. And it gives Fordola a lot of food for thought to think about, both about her circumstances and of ours. Yes. Um, despite that, um, the it eventually comes... The underlying question is, well, since you no longer don't want a king, how do you plan to rule? Lisa is going to try to bring everyone together. In the meantime, we get a summons from Nanamo. So Nanamo is also aware of her circumstances as Raubon basically was on leave in order to go ahead and view, and leave the front for Old Da. But she's known for a very long time that Raubon has been an Alamegan first. Yes. And we not only does she we walk around town with her and reminisce about their relationship, we also get to see at one point the moment at which uh, Raubon basically became um, Nanamo's right-hand man. Which is actually pretty adorable. She literally runs up to him of, sh- while she's avoiding her servants who are trying to calm her down. I believe she's supposed to be 13 at this time. I, be- I she, believe she's so. teenaged at, uh, when she- this happens. Yes. Which is at least part of the flappant uh, rebellion. Yeah. And so, nonetheless, she names Raubon her champion, and that's how he ends up being both on the Syndicate as well as uh, captain of the, the Immortal, Immortal Flames. Flames. Or the general of the Immortal Flames. Yes. Um, nonetheless, uh, she knows that push came to shove, he would be happier in All Amigo. Yeah. And so she needs to sort of decide what she wants to do with that, even though... Raubon would say that he has to go back to Ulda. To which he tries to figure out a way to help the Alamegan refugees in Ulda. Which leads us back to Kugane because she wants to uh, basically arrange... She wants to know who monetarily, outside of the monetarists, because she doesn't trust the puckers, who would be able to assist with that, which brings us, first off, to Godbert. To Godbert, who says, "You you are going to go ahead and cause another refugee crisis if you give it out of your own pocket. If you give it out of your pocket, help the Alamegan refugees while doing nothing for the Ulda people who are suffering, you're propagate you're setting everything back to before ARR. Yeah. And so she realized that wasn't going to work, which leads her then to go ahead and seek the help of Lolorito. Lord Lolorito through Hancock. Through Hancock. Uh which basically leads us to have a converse which the, uh, so we meet up in the quicksand of all not the quicksand. No the, the the, I forget what it's called, but, you know, the the Waking Sands. The Waking Sands, you remember now. The Waking Sands in uh, where the Signs of the Seven Dawn uh, hang, hang out. And so I was going to say, I see a lot more of where, because they do a lot of, this is where a, a good chunk of the political aftermath comes in. Yeah. And yeah, a lot of people who are like, why don't you just, it, who are not in politics or care about money, yeah, that is going to be something that bores the shit out of you. You, who have a business degree... Who have a, who have a business degree and an interest in politics do find that absolutely fascinating. Yeah. And even then, it's less either of those two aspects, and it's more about psychology and about how to get what you want without getting there. Yeah. And so in the end, uh, with the position that Nanamo has gained from Godbert, uh, is able to go ahead and come up with a plan that 
amuses Lola Rito enough that he's willing to throw his weight behind him. Yeah. Basically, it, I like the what she does is she wears a mask in front in front of him at the meeting table and he says, Ah, yes, it, it is quite difficult to 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 bear oneself while hiding behind the mask. Which is what Lola Rito did for the longest time, both as a member of the syndicate and to Nanamo herself. Yeah. So um, they both discard their pretenses. They both take off their masks. And it, I think this is actually the first time you see Lola Rito without his mask. Yes. Um, but And he looks like any other potato. Yes, he does, surprisingly. But the other reason that Nanamo was doing this is because she relied on Raubon for a lot of things uh, in terms of her administration. And she wanted to be able to prove to herself that she could run the country fine without Raubon. This is basically her proof. This is her way of saying... I can handle myself. Go on and do your own thing, you glorious bastard. Right. And so um, they go ahead and they, once that's settled, we get called back because the meeting is about to start. And who else but the Blue Anon to decide to show up? Yeah, the Kalyana. The Kali- I, I should mention that th- the thing that uh, Lodorino and everyone decides on is to initiate trade by using the saltery in Alamigo to trade salt to Ulda and therefore to the rest of the world. And trade back uh, stuff and also uh, incentivize the refugees to go back. Right, which, uh, not again, that get, that's a part of the reason why I think that Gold's, the Goldsmith quest line should occur naturally after Stormblood, not as a part of it because of that messaging. A lot of that conduct makes sense more after this development yeah it, this it makes a lot more sense to do it after this patch specifically yes so that quest line does occur um nanamo goes ahead uh, so nanamo resolves to go ahead and set out the initiative uh we get called in for the group meeting in gear in uh in gear albania the um other the idon Icon worshipping uh, Kaliana. The Kaliana want a seat at the table because you can't be tolerant if you exclude us. Yes. And so they manage to sneak in. Um, the um, They manage to also brainwash a couple of the members of the guard to sneak in a bunch of crystals to which they could summon Lakshmi. Lakshmi and try to go ahead and temper the entire council and get everyone under their control. Um Trying to go ahead with between ourselves and Weirford, uh, Arnvald. Arnvald, sorry. With our between ourselves and Arnvald as being the only two Echo users in the uh, area at the time, as um, uh, as Yashtola is is still bent is is outside providing support. Yashtola and Karyl are outside providing support and therefore are vulnerable yeah. to tempering. Yeah. Also, I don't think Yashtola has an Echo. Ishola doesn't have Echo? I thought no, she... no, only Kryle does. Only Kryle? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think in a uh in a one patch it was it was hinted at that she might have the Echo, but it's nothing's ever come of it. Because I'm trying to remember who in the Scions has that. Who in the Scions has the Echo? Us, Arnvald, and Kryle. Okay. And Minfilia. And Minfilia. Okay, Minfilia was four. That's why I was running like because Part of my confusion was that um, Gunbreaker fellow. Oh, Thancred. Thancred. I know Thancred doesn't have the Echo, but he also gets his his we fu- his uh, Aether flow fucked up because of what happened in uh, after the Red Wedding. Yeah. So he, and not only can he not use Aether, but he uh, but, uh, well he couldn't use magic to begin with, but now he can't use Aether. Period. As a result of Yishola's desperate attempt to pull him out. Yeah. And so. He gets fucked up, and that leads to him being sulky on top of his other issues. Yeah, that's why he looks so fucking ugly at the moment. Uh huh. Um, we go ahead, and so we have to t- we have to de- us and Arnvold try to deal with Lakshmi by ourselves. It's not going so well. Lee says she has a plan. Says get everyone else out of here, and we find out that Lee basically ran to Fordola and basically said, "Look, you want to go ahead and and." make um make uh, uh you want to keep this place for all amigos then do it on your feet or die try, or, or die pretty much say pick up a sword and fight for us or we're all dead right and so fordola uh comes out uses her resonance in order to uh help us put out put lakshmi down for good yes 
which we do. The Kalyana priestess is killed early on in this encounter. And then the rest of the, uh, Kali, uh, the, the Kalyanas flee. Yeah. To which uh, every, everyone is shocked to see Fordola. Mm-hmm. They're terrified. She drops her sword, walks away to back to her cell, to which one of the old men says, You are not forgiven, but thank you. For saving our lives. And even then, Fordola still sees, feels some of their pain. Yeah. But she also feels at least some small amount of redemption. Yes. So, this is basically one of the big things that a lot of people are contentious about. So, I don't think... So, here's the thing. They make it very clear that she's not forgiven. Yeah. And I think that the thank you was just... Again, the gesture was appreciated in the moment... But they still haven't gotten over their issue. And I think that's... If you want to go ahead and you want to talk about the female leads in terms of the aspects of war, Fordola definitely being the 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 traitor and not being forgiven, but knowing that there's going to have to be a place for her in the end. Having that discussion is one of those things where I imagine she doesn't come back after this. No, she does. Okay. So she, do, she does come back. She ends up, uh, I'm going to say that she ends up being a conscript, uh, a forced conscript of sorts. I think she has like a bomb on her neck, basically. Oh, uh, they suicide squatter? Yeah, they suicide squatter pretty much. Okay. I would say, I would, I'm going to hold judgment, but at least as of right now, I'm not, uh, I would say this is still fine. I think that a lot of people want either an instant gratification, or they want a bombastic gratification. Either that or they want her dead. I mean, that's what I mean. Instant gratification, or they want it bombastic. Either she dies in a blaze of glory, or she just dies, period. Yes. And I think that they're, they're, at least from the writing, they're playing a longer game with her. They are not finished with her yet, unlike another character we're going to talk about in a bit. Yeah. I will also say she also shows up as as the as a character in the healer role quest in Endwalker. Really? Yeah, she's part of the healer role quest in Endwalker. Okay, I'm going to be curious to see how that comes in. Yeah. Um, what I will say is that that is an ongoing theme, and I know, I think it's not going to get resolved in a pleasant way for her, and I think there's a lot of questions, but I think that her place in this story is to say that even, even those that we don't want as an outcome of war still need to have a place at the table. And I think that, that that's a very hard conversation to have if you've ever been the victim of a crime or if you've ever been, like... A victim of... Bullying or things like that. And that's difficult to say. And it's even more difficult to bring into question. But I think this address... It's a very real problem being addressed in a fake world. Yeah, and, and, and a lot of people don't know how to fucking handle it. Yes. And I think that's what is going to cause a lot of issues. But personally... Considering that it could be handled in worse ways. Yes. I will take this over anything else. Regardless, after all of this, uh, the situation calms down. Nanamo shows, uh, shows up. Uh, well, 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 Rob, on, a- after having concluded the talks with everyone in, uh, in Alamigo, is basically readying himself to go back to Old Dot, even though he doesn't want to. Yeah. We are talking with him in the Royal Menagerie. We have a nice conversation. We give our thoughts on the, on the things. And as we're leaving, we see Nanamo show up. And then they have their talk, yeah. which basically boils down to Nanamo knowing what where Raubon's heart is and basically we, uh, putting him on leave. Yeah, he says, Raubon, Aldine, you are relieved of duty. Go back to your home. Be and, happy. Mm-hmm. And so he's he's in shock, but eventually knows that this is what he wanted. He, he just didn't want to say without seemingly disappointing uh, his, lo- his his companion for the longest time. And even though there is no romantic connection, there's still a platonic relationship there. Yeah. And they relied on each other for the longest time. And he definitely is emotional. And eventually, he does come back and tell us at, tell us and everyone that. He has been relieved of duty from from Ulda, and he now wants, given that Lee still isn't really ready to uh, lead, ready to lead, he is more than willing to step up to it. And everyone definitely has no problem with that. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm going to say this right now. Lee is not ready to lead after the events of the uh, of the meeting. Mm-hmm. 
the fact that they had that she even bothered to have the Kalyana, it shows that she's not quite ready to leave. Well, it's one of the again the the whole joke about the paradox of intolerance is definitely on in play in there. And that's not an easy thing to address, even when you're dealing with it in real life. I'm not going to make any more comments. All I'm going to say is that that's that least still, I would say more go with the Fordola example. Yeah. That is still more of the highlight in terms of her not being able to deal with the crowd. It ended up working out in a, in a, in a convenient way, but that's more of why Weiss doesn't see herself ready to lead and would rather have Rabon in charge anyway. Yeah. Um, Pippin is then promoted to general, and it now is going to be filling in the shoes since he is. Um, he, I think he still was like the second in command anyway. He was second in command in not, Uldah. N- not barring the fact that he's also the general's son. Yes. Um, I think I joked to you at one point it would be funny to see um, Pippin and Nano be a thing. I think we ran the numbers; they were similar ages. Yeah, they're uh, they're of similar ages, so it could be a thing. I. I haven't seen it happen, but then again, I haven't done everything in this game yet. Right, and I and I, I don't I don't think they would be that obvious, especially for two side characters. So, but it w- but it's a funny head cannon for me, so I'm going to keep it at that. Yeah, but with that, that ends patch four point one. The legend returns. Patch four point two uh, has a start off with the fact that uh, oh, so there was one. So we end of credit scene. Oh yeah, um, good old Gosetsu makes it back to Kugane. With Yotsuyu in hand, who is acting a little bit odd. Very odd, but that gets... Exp- that, but we are that, about We'll to- get to that in a moment. Yes, so um, it does come back to us that we are going to uh, go into... So it comes back to us that uh, Alamigo seems to be fine for the moment. Yeah, and so we get a message from Hancock saying that something has come up and he wants us to see about it. That thing being the fact that Gotsetsu's sword has shown up on the market board. Yes, so apparent. So with um, Alphino in tow, along with Yugiri, uh, we basically hunt down the merchant, find out that uh, yes, a samurai matching Gosetsu's ex- description sold Gosetsu's sword in order to get fee for to, pr- to travel to Ruby Sea. Yes, so apparently, uh, it's it turns out that um, not only is Gosetsu alive, but so is Yotsuyu. Um, the Garleans are also aware of this fact and send out a contingent to go deal with them. To kill Gosetsu and to recover Yotsuyu. Well, it seems like those priorities are more reversed because initially it seems like they only care about Yotsuyu, but then when we intervene, then they decide to go into a bloodbath. Yeah. Killing Gosetsu would have just been the means to the end for the first, for the first objective. Nonetheless, we go ahead and deal with, um, the enemy. Gosetsu is reunited with the party. And we find out what's been going on with, uh, with Yotsuyu, or is she's just being called for now Suyu? She basically has amnesia. She either hit her head really hard, or the, the gun, the, uh, slice to her body, or whatever, whatever it was, she's basically a child mentally at this point. Not, so, I think that... I'm, I'm not a medical person, so I don't know, but I've just seen enough of it on TV. It's I. It's very much more uh, trauma of the near-death experience that caused her to regress, and so she has no i she she has no memory of her past life, no idea of who she was. She just knows that the only that this that Gosetsu is a kind man who saves her. And she basically wants to help him out as best as she can. She's basically seeing him as a father figure. And Gotsetsu, who lost his wife and kid, is starting to see Suyu as a daughter. And treats her as such. Yeah. And so uh, we take him back to the uh, to the Domen Enclave. And we go ahead and we reunite him with Hien and uh, Yugiri. They have conversations. And the topic naturally turns to... What are we doing with Yotsuyu? If she does not remember anything, she is free to stay in Doma. But has to be kept under guard because everyone still remembers what Yotsuyu looks like. And at one point, she sneaks out to try and grab some fruit. Oh, wait, that's, that's the next patch. Okay, but basically, the same concerns that they have about Fordola apply here. Yes. However, in fact, to the point that one of the guards asks to be relocated because he used to be her sugar daddy. No, her no, pimp. Her pimp, I her think. Pimp. Yes, so we find out, again, uh, through another echo, that one of the Doman, sol- Doman resistance soldiers 
uh, in another life, actually uh, pimped out Yotsuyu, uh, which put her down the dark path that she went. Uh, just as a reminder from the last episode, uh, Yotsuyu was the abused daughter of a, of a Doman couple. Uh, they so basically sold her off so that the younger brother could get a better education. Yeah. And so uh, this led to her being sold in Doma. She was a she was a geisha, a very popular one because apparently they enjoyed being uh, abused. They they enjoyed her coldness, and then later on she learned her enjoyment for being for uh, her. She she found out she picked up her sadism through that trade, and, and then, that set her down the dark path of being the woman she became as that eventually became a viceroy. Yeah, allowed her to be to serve as a spy for Doma. Spy against Doma. Spy against Doma for the Garleans. Yeah. And that... And, and I, I, I remember saying to you this as we watched the, the cutscene. I have never seen someone be more responsible. The, we found the art teacher that led to the funny German man's uh, path of uh, tyranny. Yes. Basically... We found the priest that saved him, saved him from drowning. Yes. Because that was also a thing, too. Okay. But I, I, I put, would correlate this more to the art teacher that failed him because... It wasn't. It it was the inferiority complex that made him who he was. Anyway, yeah. Uh, Fair. So we we we, we he's repositioned, and he and basically says he was a different man, but still we need to hold him accountable. Yeah. And so at that point, we, we also get a arrival of the Garleans. Well, it turns out that they are they are st there's still some activity out of the castrum nearby, and so we go out with you, Geary, to see what it is. And then it turns out that the Garlean ship lets out a white smoke signal. A white flag of sorts. Which is only to those who are aware of Doman culture. Yes. Which intrigues Hien. He says, let them land. Let's see what they want. Which leads to your least favorite character of the entire expansion, who I thought could not be more dickish because Hancock and the Namazu already exist. Oh, trust me, I despise this little shit. Asahi Sas Brutus. So, Asahi is Yotsuyu's brother. Stepbrother. Stepbrother. Um, I don't think that was made clear in the flashbacks, but he is stepbrother, nonetheless. He, he is stepbrother to Yotsuyu, and he comes with this biggest shit-eating grin on his face saying, Let us broker peace with Doma and Garlemald. And so, uh, we enter step two of politics, our fun arc. As basically a lot of conversation uh, boils down to this. Doma has uh, possession of Garlean soldiers as well as Yotsuyu in particular. And Garlemald has uh, Doman conscripts. Lots of Doman conscripts. They basically agree that if they are going to cooperate because that's going to be better than uh, long-term outfighting. Should do a, a trade. A of prisoner pr exchange. A, a prisoner exchange. Um, uh, Hyen has a couple of questions. I thought you weren't trading with people that were under your own subjects. It says, no, 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 no. We respect your sovereignty. We actually want to unite with you in order to deal with the primal ins. With the primal problem. Yes. With the primal icons. Which leads to uh, item line item number two. Both parties agreed no longer to summon any primals. Yeah. Or to deal with any primal summoning. Yes. And so therefore, Doma has to keep an eye on the Kojin. Which they say, that's not going to be a problem. We, we pretty much have them under control. Um, but they basically say that the only the only hang up on Yotsuyu is that you have to go ahead and let us hold up. We have to, and, and they actually show her off. They actually show Asahi uh, they... confronting her and her being her adult self. Yeah. To which Asahi says, okay, if she doesn't recover her, they agree that if Yotsuyu doesn't recover her memories or remains in this state then she can remain with the Domans. Otherwise, she gets transferred along with everyone else. Right. So that much is at least initially understood from the parties. And there's, of course, a lot more politicking going on in the background. As we're taking Asahi back to his ship, uh, we encounter two characters, uh, the uh, Doman children that we encountered in Stormblood, yes. being attacked by the Red Kojin, to which Asahi comes in to jump in and to defend them from the Kojin, in which we join in to help as well. Which, very interesting because he seems to come off as very genuine in wanting to, uh, he, we have him, while Hien is considering details about the peace bargaining, 
uh, basically has uh, uh, us and Yugiri take him around Doma, uh, basically as an ambassador's field trip. Yeah. Which leads to this encounter with the Red Coach, and Asahi does assist in their defense, and then as he's about to leave, basically reveals that it's all an act. Pretty much, he gives us the biggest grimace possible, because it turns out he is the number one Xeno simp. Yes, so he we get an echo of him basically being during the invasion. He was a foot. He was on the front lines, uh, about to be basically ambushed by more than two dozen men. Zeno strat, uh, uh, struts on in. Struts on in. Basically makes jokes. Basically makes meat pies out of the domains, and he has the biggest hard on for Zenos the entire time. Oh yeah. And so this leads to him having an admiration to Xenos and Xenos saying, huh, you're different. And Asahi taking that context, that uh, basic compliment in a completely obsessive tone, uh, which leads him down the path that he is. Yeah. He also basically says, he also basically hints to you that he's doing this specifically because he wants you, he's trying to piss you off in his machinations to get you to throw the first punch. Yeah. He's saying, ah, 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 don't touch me, don't touch me, otherwise you'll cause a diplomatic incident. To, to which, um, to which my warrior of light's saying is, that doesn't mean I can't steal your pants. <laughs> and, and to which, basically, we, we are, we, I remember asking you early on, how long does it last until the mask drops? And we don't even get him off the fucking island. Before the mask drops on this one. Yeah, I was thinking, oh wait, does the mask drop at the end of this patch? Or does it drop at the next patch? I was like, oh no, it happens now. Yes, so uh, so it's very played out that, yes, Asahi, you are supposed to hate him. Yeah. And that his machinations will run a bit deeper as, um, as the plot plays out. But Asahi is going to basically wait for the answer. And then uh, we'll proceed onward. However, as we go back to go speak with Hien... Yotsuyu is missing. Well, that's... Still later? That's still later. Okay. That's the next patch. Okay, so... Um, well, what happens is... Uh, let's see. <laughs> yeah, so we're now on the patch 4.3. So so basically, him leaving is the end of, of patch 4.2. Yes. Okay. Patch 4.3 is... Gotsetsu and Suyu are acting like a father and daughter, mostly. And she is basically washing him and seeing all the bullet holes that she had left in his back. Well, not only that, but uh, this came up, I think this did come up in 4.2, but Gotsuyu basically ran out. We we knew that Gotsuyu... Gosetsu. He, Gosetsu. Gosetsu from his early incarnation had been a samurai since Kayan's time, yeah. which is Hien's father. And so he is an old he is an old samurai. We get that even through his in, uh, throughout uh, Stormblood. Yeah. And so basically, in the aftermath of saving Yotsuyu from the from the from the uh, Doma Castle's collapse, as well as the entirety of the trek back, again making fun of the fact that he was doing it on an empty stomach, called back to his original arrival in Eorzea, he basically has run out of energy. He, he basic his fighting days are long over. Yeah. And although he probably can fight, he definitely would not be able to fight in the way that he used to. Yes. And so um, that has led to Yotsuyu taking uh, Suyu taking over, at, being his caretaker for the time being. Yeah. And to which uh, Gotsetsu reminisces on, oh, it's that time of year again. How I would love to have a persimmon. And so uh, Yotsuyu does remember this as she's cleaning him and, he, and Gotsetsu is having conversations with us. Yes. And so afterwards as we are still waiting to have an answer yotsuyu seemingly flees before the exchange is, the prisoner exchange is set to be done yeah and it causes a massive panic especially because she ends up going into the village of where the, ev- of the mai of the mai where everyone remembers the the chaos she wrapped yeah everyone calling her the witch everyone terrified of her but everyone man but we managed to get up to her in time and managed to prevent any brouhaha from happening yes which Master, uh, masterful gambit, he had. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thankfully, um, thankfully everything works out. Suyu is not recovered yet. No. But she does, and, and her escape is played off as a, uh, a, a, as as the childish ramblings, and she's brought back with persimmons. Yes. She she brings the persimmon to uh, Gosetsu. And then Asahi comes in bearing a couple. 
a yeah. couple of assholes. Yeah, so it, at the, the prisoner exchange is set to happen. And just to make sure, he brings he, he brings the step that he brings the parents in just to make to see that it because she didn't remember Asahi's face, but maybe seeing the parents would bring something. Yeah, he brought her parents back, which the ones who sold her off. Uh, and which so just as a yeah, I was about to say that, but yeah, so uh, which further inflicts trauma on Suyu, who doesn't recognize them, but definitely has a, a traumatic a traumatic response to them. So much so that later that evening, she tries to kill herself because she is scared of what she is. Well, which leads to the parents incidentally finding them on a, on a evening stroll, which, unbeknownst to any party, does trigger enough trauma that Tsuyu does remember who she is. To which she goes she, not. She, she reverts back to her old self and then proceeds to murder her parents. Yep. She just... She takes the knife she was going to use to kill herself and runs it through. Mm-hmm. And the only thing that she has on her, aside from the knife, is a moon mirror that Asahi brought her when he first visited her at the time. Yeah. That comes relevant later. Um, so nonetheless, Asahi sees what has happened and whisks her away. As she now does remember and everyone is panicked because Yotsuyu is missing. And thus we go to go ahead and hunt it, stop the Garleans. Who, one, not only does Yotsuyu Yotsu believe herself to be back to normal, Asahi then reveals his final gambit. Make her into a primal. Which he does because that moon mirror is not just any moon mirror, but is the moon mirror to the guardian of the kami of the moon, Tsukuyomi. Yeah, to which she uses that with a bunch of crystals that were on board the ship to create Tsukuyomi. And thus begins the trial, Castrum Bulbinus. Yes, so... So, you ca- ca- you did this by yourself, and I am mad at that, because I wanted to help you through that fight. Yes, well, I thought I would go ahead and try and expedite some of the matters for us, but it ended up being fine, because that was a very fun fight. But it probably has... It, it, it has the weight for Stormblood of what... And the dragon song is for Heaven's War. Yes. It basically, uh, because it's a normal primal fight at the start, she has a lot of white and black stuff, uh, left side of the moon, dark side of the moon type attacks. But, yeah, basically, one side of the room is going to be dark, one side of the room is going to be light. Don't stay on one side for too long, because it'll be an insta-kill. Yes, and so basically you have to switch sides in order to maintain balance. And at some point, you manage to break through to the original... Yotsuyu, who basically summons primals, or who basically summons her own traumas to try and attack her, and you have to protect her, or yeah. suffer an insta loss. And you basically fight apparitions of her uh, parents, her parents, Garlean soldiers, Garlean soldiers, and eventually Asahi himself. Finally, culminating in Zeno showing up, to which Gosetsu, Gosetsu a a spare specter of Gosetsu. Which is represents the kindness that Gosetsu had had brought to her in the in her last moments of life, and gone ahead and protects her from Zenos, which we assist in battering away. Which, yeah. despite her still wanting to continue to fight at us, she definitely at least feels something from that moment. Yeah. And then the big AOE attack happens, and one of the best songs of, Sha- of Stormblood plays "Wayward Daughter." Yep. That is actually one of my favorite songs from Stormblood. It, it is very nice. It is very appropriate here. And I would say at this point, this fight probably was, mechanically was nothing special. It's more about that, it's more about that inter, intermission where you deal with all the phantoms that I find more interesting yeah. for me. She does the whole Shiva circles thing with the fans. She will do line AoEs. She will, she will summon clouds that you have to deal with, pretty much. Yes, but it's very it's a very good mechanical fight, but definitely it's the story that, that I would say is more memorable. And then Asahi even now gloats triumph because he didn't care he did he knew that yeah, you're you're gonna kill a primark. That's not the issue. Yeah. The issue is you we did this after the prisoner exchange, which means no summoning is to be occurring on anyone's soil. Where did the summoning occur? On Doman's soil. Whose fault is that? Yours! We don't have to agree to anything after all! Yeah, and, and, and so and he tries shooting 
Yotsuyu, who is currently lying on the ground, still glowing with uh, Sukiyomi's magic. Whoa. He kicks her repeatedly, frustrated with her. Well, he's upset because we haven't killed, we haven't finished the job, as it were, because uh, he because normally most of the time it does kill the the whoever is the primal um, yeah can't conduit. In this case, we she's still alive, but Yasahi is mad, so he goes ahead and finishes the job himself. Only to get skewered in return because Yotsuyu managed to hold on to enough divinity that she could coup de gras him in return. Because that was her end goal. She wanted to get rid of all her troubles. Which, and she was very much aware that she was being played, but she figured that she could at least hold on to some fragment of divine power to be able to lay waste to him. So she impales him with two swords, uh... Uh, reminisces on how sweet the pain is and stuff like that and then the uh, the swords explode in him and he gets sent flying and then her power is gone and then we have the final words to say to her where Suyu deserves better. Yep. And uh, everyone comes in afterwards relieved that the primal threat is taken care of. Also the sad thing is that, that uh, Yotsuyu says she wonders if the persimmon was sweet for Gosetsu. So, which implies that even though she didn't have her memories, she was act. She was cognizant of of what she did and genuinely felt something for Kotetsu too. Yeah. Um, of course, the other thing is that Kotetsu didn't get to say goodbye, and so Kotetsu basically walks upon Suyu's lifeless body, and he is heartbroken as well. So heartbroken, in fact, that that well, something will happen. But first off. Maxima, one of Asahi's uh, Garlean uh, cohorts, still wants to try to get the the, uh, the priestly agreement done because he's a member of the Popularis. So, um, and so part of the political talk was that Asahi claims that he was a member of the Popularis, which is a mostly um, lo- lower-born group of Garlean citizens who basically disagree with a lot of the nobilities. Expansionist ideas. Uh, expansionist ideas. What was the name of the uh, of the upper class compared to the popularis? Oh fuck, I don't remember. Because I know that because I remember going into a big diatribe with you because the popularis, uh, rep- are, the, uh, because Garlean is based off of Roman culture, a lot of that ancient history actually has backing. There is the because um, a very similar structure where you had the. Um, uh, where you had two similar roles, and I can't even remember what the names of the original ones were. Um, I'm going to look at this up. Okay. So it's the Popularis and... Oh, Optimates. And the Optimates, which the Optimates are meant to be the equivalent to the... Uh, and I forgot what the real-life version of it... Um, uh, but I will go ahead and remember it in a moment. Uh, Regardless, uh, Maxima wants to uh, broke peace, and so Alphano Alpha shows up. The patricians and the plebeians, that's who they're, they're supposed to mirror. Oh, the patricians and the plebeians. Yes, yeah. so um, so Maximus is a member of, is is a actual member of the Popularis who wants to go ahead and seek some kind of stability, whereas Asahi was, was just playing. Was just playing, acting as an uh, Optimatus agent. Um, Alphano is interested to find out what things are like on the other side and agrees to go in both because he is the scion who has the best skill set for it, but also because we also have an echo at the very end from Asahi showing us that Xenos is still alive. Somehow alive. He apparently was dead. Dead, but apparently he's acting different. We know enough about Xenos to know that he wouldn't be using such flowery words. Talking about balance and stuff like that. Hi, Elidibus! So, we suspect that there is some kind of Ashian uh, involvement at play here. And Alphano wants to go to confirm. So, he goes with Maxima aboard uh, the Garlean ship to get over there. Which is the first time since probably... ARR that we've been without him? I don't think we've ever been without Alfie. Because remember, we start, we met him initially when all the three leaders were doing their speeches. Right. And then um, later on in the story, he we do get introduced to him as he goes ahead and agrees to help uh, us as, we, as we're as we looking for Sid. Right. 
So, and he's been with us the entire way through. He's been with us from ARR to Heaven's Ward and, and, oh, we, we missed one other detail. Yeah? Um, when we go ahead and we're tracking down Gosetsu through his sword, uh, Alphano, know- in a show of good faith, agrees to purchase it at sticker price without approval from a Tataru Taru. Which not only pisses off Tataru so much that she is probably going to be hunting Alphano in her in his sleep, but basically she is forced to go ahead and seek other means to replenish the Scion's coffers. Which will then go into the Four Lords quest line, which we will cover in the next episode. Yes. So, um, but Alphano basically has been with us this entire time and has been almost the Scion presence ever since Minfilia died. Yeah. And so it really feels weird without him being present. Yeah. And so Alphano goes off on the Garlean ship. We return to uh, the Dome and Enclave where the prisoners are brought back and they meet with their family. And then we encounter Gotsetsu, who has shaven his head. Yes. And so Gotsetsu explains that he needs to go ahead and do some soul searching and decides to go on a pill. Uh, and ask for relief to go on a pilgrimage to go ahead and grant peace to those who have been affected by the war as well, in yes. his own way. He's basically becoming a monk. Right. And and goes on this journey um, with Hien's permission, and says, so long for now. So long for now. He does show up again in the Endwalker uh, uh, role quests. Okay. So... That is for the range DPS. If I'm okay, so that'll be interesting to see that as a mas- as a machinist. Um, afterwards, we very much get uh, get some much needed reconnaissance. As um, yeah, we basically go back to the Rising Stones, we meet up with all the Scions who are all making their own plans to deal with the Garleans currently. Thankra's going to do some recon, and Alice is Alice is anxious as fuck because she's trying to hear back from her brother. To which we get a a uh, a scene transition. Scene transition to which. Uh, at first, things are going well. They're flying over an area called the Burn, which is basically a desolate white wasteland devoid of ether from too much uh, primal summoning. And it became the basis for which the ancient Garlean nobles saw that the icons have no place in this world because they will eventually make everywhere like this. Yeah. Well, basically, it was uh, Solus Oscalvus who said that. It, to be honest... He was still alive until recently. Mm-hmm. Right, that he was he was ixnayed by Zenos, which is le- which is why he no, was... no, he wasn't ixnayed by Zenos. What was wasn't there a wasn't there a murder which is resulted in a new king on the throne? No, no. Uh, Solus Oxcaldus just died. Oh, he just outright died. He just outright died, which allowed for Varus to okay. ascend to the throne after a bloody revolution. Oh, okay, and then. Xenos became the crown prince. And Xenos became crown prince. Okay, so everyone just took a step to the left. Yes. Okay. Um, so, d- but despite that, but um, despite that, um, they actually get fired on by their own ships. Yes. As apparently Xenos is found out about them because it's on Xenos' own personal guard. It's the royal fleet. that That is intervening on this behalf. And now we get the first of several uh, cuts, uh, central instances in which you're actually playing as a different character yeah this is the first one you get to play as alfino you get to play as an academian is what i believe his class is called yes he's, he's basically a, a he gets to, he gets to play both summoner and scholar scholar at the same time yeah which is fucking weird yes but then again he gets access to a special type of carbuncle that no one else has access to you must have the evies i must have the evies uh, but nonetheless uh mid-combat a uh, Garlean soldier comes out of the woodwork, and he seems to assist us in fending off with the fending off the royal fleet. To which his attacks look oddly familiar, and it took me a bit to realize because yeah, almost anyone who's trained with the gunblade in them has those attacks. But then eventually, I remember who he is because he refuses to be identified. He calls himself Shadow Hunter. He literally says, "You can trust me" by throwing an Asian mask that he is off. And on his belt, you can see he's killed a few black masks. Not only that, he's killed a few red masks, which are the leaders. Yes. But on his belt, as the as the uh, uh, patch ends, 
we cut it, we zoom in on a white mask that looks oddly familiar. Yep. So who is it? So it's guys Van, Van Belsar. Bingo. He survived. He, was, he survived getting exploded by Ultima. Yeah. So that's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. But that's not the only stinger we get. Yeah. We also get uh, someone at the uh, Rima Runa Light. Uh, I assume it's Rima Runa because that's the, Rita Runa Lighthouse. Rita Runa Lighthouse examining some of the wreckage. And it's a seemingly... That's, that's the cutscene that we saw at the end of... Uh... Oh, we, we, we forgot this. So, after we can after seeing the echo of Xenos alive, yeah. the first thought is, wait, isn't his body supposed to be entombed somewhere? We go to see it. We go to see it, have it uncovered, and yeah, the body's gone. Yeah, Thancred says, oh dear, we seem to be missing a corpse. To which, there's a zoom out to an unknown... Elizin. Elizin soldier... Uh, resistance soldier who eventually makes his way to the Rita Rana lighthouse. Um, not only well, it's not the Rita Rana light- lighthouse. It's just some garly and wreckage from the from. It looks like the lighthouse. It could be. It that's the only reason I say it because. Um, but it, he examines some garly and wreckage, offs the supervisor that comes to check on him, and then starts to growl in a very familiar tone. Growl in a very very tone and talk about how the hunt must continue as he flies off in a in a personal in a in a uh, recovered Garlean helicopter personal vessel. So, uh, I still don't understand how the fuck Zeno's body hopped. Uh, remember in ARR where that once a Hagen basically body hopped vaguely, but yes, because he was gifted the power of the Echo by the Asians, and so he kept body hopping when uh. When uh, 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 Admiral uh, Merle Webb kept shooting him, uh, but he was only destroyed because Leviathan ended up absorbing him. Ah, uh, okay. But yeah, basically the Echo allows you to body hop, basically. Mm. So that also seems to be a, a factor in with the artificial resonance. Yes. Probably only because he got the, the finished version, whereas for Dola has the imperfect one. Right. So he is able to go ahead. He apparently grabbed onto one of the bodies of a dead soldier, revived himself, and basically just snuck away as he goes ahead and deals with the Asian who pilfered his body. Bingo. He's looking to get his body back while the other Asian is doing whatever in Xenos' body. Cosplaying around and pretending to be the crown prince. Pretty much. Yeah, and basically, if you couldn't tell by the way that Z- that Xenos' body was talking about light and darkness, Elidibus is basically piloting that body. Yes, and that explains why he was having the conversation with uh, Xenos' father after after the initial conflict is over. Yeah, when he took the mask off, you basically knew that it was Xenos under that robe. Hmm. Yeah. Nonetheless, um... That's all we have done so far. So... We need to finish up Patch Quest, not because I want to get through that, but because we didn't get to talk about a very particular joke you and I have been waiting for years to be able to discuss on this show. Yes, I kept thinking it was sooner. No, it was not. It's going to be in the next series. I literally Patches. thought when Patch uh, 4.2 was called Rise of a New Sun, it was literally going to have that joke in it, but I was a fucking idiot. No, it's it comes in much later. I believe it comes in next patch because let me check the post Stormblood, post Stormblood NSQ. If I recall right, it comes after the next dungeon, which will be the Burn. Yes. Okay, so we do end up going to. Uh, it's so it looks like we are going to pay a little visit to Garlmald in order to go ahead and rescue Alphano. Well, no, we're go yeah, well we're going to the burn to see what happened. Right. So, yeah. So, there's only at- seven quests in Prelude and Violet. There's five quests in part 1 of patch 4.5 and there's and- only two quests in 4.56 and one and one other dungeon besides. Yeah, there's the burn and the Gimlet Dark. Okay. And there's going to be several uh solo instances with uh the Scions. Okay. Um Aside from that, it's going to be p- finishing up the Machinist quest line and going to be finishing up Astrologian. Um, we also need to do... We have done Omega already. We only need to do the Four Lords at this point. And yeah. I think we will have been ready for Storm for Shadowbringers. Yes. 
here's the one thing that's going to hold up, not this coming episode, but the follow, but actually Get, not the, fo- well, yes, the following episode, getting into Shadowbringers proper. Getting into Shadowbringers proper is not going to be the big deal. The big deal is the prep work I have to do for patch Shadowbringers. Yeah, which the only thing you really need to do is play near Automata. Go. I want you to look up right now while we are live. I want you to look up how long to complete near Automata. How long to complete near Automata? Twenty-one hours when focusing on main objectives. How long? What is the um? Spend up to sixty-one hours to obtain a hundred percent completion. Right. And remember, this is. Main hour, uh, main plus sides, which is what I would consider for a more rounded experience. 37 and a half hours. So almost 40 hours. 40 hours before to prep for one series of dungeons. <laughs> On top of Shadowbringers and all the other nonsense that I normally do. You know what? Worst comes to worst, I'm just going to link you to Clemson's uh, near videos. Oh, no, no, no. I'm going... This is one of those games you have to play. And to be honest, a little Yoko Taro Madness is probably going to be appreciated. Fair enough. Fair so, enough. So if anything else, I do need to play this one. I refuse to play uh, Replicant. Yeah. We are not playing Replicant for this. No, you do not need to play Replicant for this. So Just watch Clemson's videos for that. No, I, 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 I'm trying to remember... If, Wooly Wolves has done this one, or if they just talked about it, but... Oh, God, Wooly. How <laughs> long is that Let's Play? 500, 500 episodes? Not that long, and I don't even remember if he's done it. All I know is that they've talked ad nauseum about that about that series, because Yoko Taro is equally as much of a madman as most of the other madmen in Japanese gaming industry. Suda51, uh, Hideo, Hideo Kojima, Kojima um, Yoko Taro comes up, um, who do we put as the fourth on the mount, on this Mount Rushmore of Madness? Oh, God, I don't know. Uh, you said Suda51, so... Mm. I said Suda, I said, uh... Oh, Miyazaki. We have to put... He may be a genius, he may be the most genius of the four, but he is still a madman. Oh, he is still a madman with a foot fetish. Miyazaki. Why do you think, uh, the candle holder in Dark, in, uh, Demon Souls, uh, uh... Melania, uh, are all barefoot. Uh, Priscilla, even. This, this, this is, this has been Leo. This has been Ray. And I did not need to know that information. <laughs> Too bad. You know it. Enjoy the curse. Later, I'm out! Later, guys. <laughs>